Well, hello, hello. We're back again. Let me uh, get this chat booted up on here. Give me a second. Boot this up. Make sure that this is all going. So this video here, I kind of had some notes on this in the background. What I was going to do was go through, and they did make some changes in Odyssey as far as the menus are concerned. I didn't go in and change anything from Original Elite since I went through and played. Like when I play games like Ark, Survival Evolved, whatever, any of those games, because I've been on a computer for such a long time, I have some settings that I require very specific when I play. It doesn't really matter graphic cards or any of that kind of stuff. Most of the games auto-optimize to whatever the space is, because there's range. I mean, really, the same settings aren't going to work for someone else, typically. There are some basics, some basic stuff that really sets up a measure of success and fail in the space right off the bat. Arc has a lot of stuff. If you just leave the settings the way they are and play it like that, it's not going to work. And the lead is very much like that. There's a lot of settings inside there that if you don't adjust and methods of properly, it's going to cause some disruption. And I don't use a HOTUS or a joystick or anything else. We're going to go mouse and keyboard controls. The reason why I have these controls set the way that I do it's very specific because I've been using a computer for a long time, so I know what durational use and time frame of will have an effect on the rest of the body. So you'll start getting finger cramps and, and disruptions anatomically, not just mental uh, strain and, and such. So if it's not set easily, you got to hop around that keyboard too much. It's not as fluid or as fast as it could be. You want to make sure that the settings are like secondary, just like getting up out of your chair or walking. They need to be accessible to that point. So I'm going to hop over in Elite because there's too many settings to really type or talk about in that fashion. It's easier to do it directly inside the menus. So on the main screen, obviously, you load up Elite. And I'm going to hop over, make sure this is all good. I'm going to hop over to the main screen in Elite. And I'll walk you through what you got to do. So first off, you install it, you're kind of set in there. At most, you might have a Sidewinder setting here, but if not, then you, then you won't. These menus have had a lot of changes over the course of Elite being in here, so some menu options for different commanders might be a little bit different. But I go right into the Options screen. Some of that's marked off, but Options. I mean, it's right there. You go to the Options screen, and there's a list. We've got a whole range. Controls, graphics, audio, network, credits, and clear the save if, if so be. Credits, we know who it is. Frontier makes the game. Full list of people. Network, that's all depending on where you have it. I don't have anything in there that I change that isn't optimized to my own space. That's all going to be individualized. Audio, the same. It's going to vary based off PC and its capacity. Graphics is basically the same thing, though I'm going to go into it because I do have to, for myself, change a few things in here because I can't have certain things. It'll cause a disruption for me. Give me vertigo or whatever because I can't do a lot of weird motions. And you see I do a lot of combat stuff and it doesn't bother me if I set up proper. But if I play a game like Minecraft or something or even on Ark and I do screen shake on there, I'm going to be having problems. So the number one setting on here that I change is right here. Reduce camera shake. I put that on. I got to have it. If I, if I don't, I'm in big trouble. I take and I turn off the GUI effects and I turn off the vehicle motion blackout. Off. Not, not able to do it. Can't have it. No good. I have the vehicle maintain horizon camera on because if I don't have that, it doesn't seem like I'm in the space. We're not talking some oddities in there where I'm in zero gravity setting in the seat, and that's kind of how it feels in the game if you have it off. So I have it on. The last setting, disable idle hand animations, I have it off. It doesn't matter to me that my guy's hand's moving around. It doesn't bother me at all. I have the cursor set to on, and the dashboard brightness is all personal perspective. Whatever you would like. You can dial it up, dial it down, whatever you would like. My field of view is set right perfectly in the center, but you can adjust it and give yourself a wider field of view. It does help in combat. You can back it off or zoom it in, whatever you like. I don't change anything from the center as far as that's concerned. Right where it is is as if I'm positioned in the seat. If I need to... There's another button which I'll go over that I can take a look out my windows just as anything else. The rest of the time, I'm focused on what's in front of me. I have the same field of view in my ship as I do when I set in my car. That's about what you're trying to dial in. So when you're looking at your screen, 
your field of view, you'll adjust that to whatever works for you as far as what your field of view is. What are you used to seeing? If you have never drove a vehicle or sat in the driver's seat of something, your field of view may be different. If you're used to just playing video games, you're going to adjust that according to yourself. So that's all you. The shaders, I have them automatically set up on preparation for the startup because Frontier goes in and makes changes to those. So doing any oddities to that could throw it off in the game. So I let that automatically do that. I have the same thing for other games. I let that automatically happen. There are times when I turn shaders, shaders completely off because they cause problems, depending on the game. In this instance, they're on. Shaders do not affect the game space for Elite as far as I am concerned and how I play. So on, right? In the center, come down, cursor, right? I want to see it. Dashboard brightness, self-adjust, whatever you like. Off, on, off, on, off. It's that simple. Those are the settings for graphics. I change nothing else graphically. It's all automatically dialed in every Thursday when they make changes. These settings now, unlike most other programs, don't continuously change in the background on you. So those stay the way that they are, right? Controls, on the other hand, they've broken these menus down. We've got SRV, we've got ship, and we've got general controls. So the general controls on here, each one of these breakdowns. So all I'm going to do is expand one out and show you the categories. So for me, the interface, as far as panel up, panel down, panel left, panel right, I've got WASD. I mean, that's gamer mode. That's been gamer mode since day one. Those are our navigation keys, WASD, right? None of these have been changed. All of these settings are exactly what are in the game. The only ones that ever change will show up as orange. They'll light up. None of these are orange. They're all white. So these are all automatically inside there. So besides that, right, panel select, space bar, back is backspace, right, logic. We're talking logic. So all those are normal keys to navigate around, up, down, left, right, and back and forward. Except as spacebar, right? If you like except as enter, you could use except as enter. You could change it if you would like. These are all presets automatically in. So no changes as far as interface. Galaxy map, as far as the galaxy map is concerned, when you're looking at the galaxy map, these are all presets already in here. None of these have been changed either. They're all exactly how the game comes. Know what these keys are, and we're going to get into that a bit. Because I'm going to go into the game and actually show you how these function literally in it. But these are all exactly how they have it. None of these have been changed. All the same. Camera suite. Same thing. Changed zero inside here from what the settings are. Free camera, on the other hand, I've made some adjustments here. I've changed it to full range. I want the access of being able to move my camera around at maximum range because I like to take a lot of screenshots inside the space so I want to you know see some cool stuff so I put full range on it. I want to see all of it everything so when I go to free camera mode I can go everywhere 100% speed so I can hurry up get my picture and then move out we continue to scroll down on here as far as moving it around I have pitch inverted that's me I'm used to doing piloting and such so I invert it I have yaw as the mouse access, so that when I move the mouse, it moves it properly. You'll get the feel of how that works. If you use pitch inverted, you'll know how yaw affects your mouse movement inside the game. The free camera mouse sensitivity I have dialed down from where it was originally. I have it at, at most a squeeze under 25%, because it moves around quite rapidly already. It's hard to do micro-tuning when you're zooming into something, and I do a lot of external ship exploration as well as inside. I need to take a look at something, so I make an adjustment here so that I can do that. I have it dialed in for myself. Others may want to change that and slide that bar back and forth. It's just like mouse sensitivity for anything else. You may enjoy it to be faster. You may enjoy it to be slower. It might be too difficult to move it around micro-tuning it, but I'm used to it. So I've adjusted this over time. It was dialed even less until I got used to it and I gradually increased it. And this is where it's been setting for the last four or five years. I haven't moved it since that point. It works perfectly. I have relative mouse Y-axis turned on, and I have relative mouse X-axis X turned on. So the position of my mouse is the position, clearly. 
it's just much easier to navigate. So if I move the mouse right, it moves right. If I move it left, it moves left. Pretty simple. Up, down, all that. Easy. I've changed nothing else as far as that is concerned on here. This little category here is the key one for me. Full range. And these. Pitch, inverted, yaw, on, uh. That's it. Nothing else. Halo me, done nothing. Left it the same. Playlist, same. Store camera, same. No changes. Go back. Ship controls. Now these are extensive. There's a lot in here. So I'll open up mouse. You can see I did the same thing here. Yaw, right off the bat for x-axis. And pitch for y-axis. So when I'm flying, where I move my mouse is the position that I'm moving my ship around. I have relative mouse x-axis off and relative mouse y-axis off. I just want yaw and pitch. That's simple. It's easier to manipulate the ship using the mouse for me. It's more of a simulation. It's as if I'm using a joystick, but I'm not. So then I come down and I got mouse sensitivity again. It's your own settings, whatever you would wish. Relative mouse rate I have also. It's your settings, whatever you're used to. At the dead zone dialed down a bit than what it had. I need that dead zone to be zeroed out. I do a lot of combat. I need there to not be so much float in there or so much delay when I move the mouse. Then there are other instances in which it needs to go. A little bit different. I have the mouse power curve to the bottom. Literally. Mouse widget on. I need to see it in order to be able to use it. So I turn it on. right? So I can see it. When I move the mouse, I know where it is. That simple. No other changes. Yaw, off, pitch, off. Personal preferences, ah, Super easy. No real problem there. Flight rotation. I've made some changes in here as well. I have yaw into roll off. I have yaw into roll sensitivity set exactly where it is. Because I have it being managed by something else. Default to standard controls, if you would like to, you can do that and turn that. I have flight assist off automatically. I have to engage it by another button, right? So I go in, I got left and right. These are all normal stature, no changes, zero, just this, off, that's it. I have its preset, it's in the mouse. I don't need a button to do it, the mouse is handling Flight thrusters, same. I have not changed. My thrusters are right by WASD. To go left, I have it Q, which is just tipping your finger to the left-hand side. It goes left. I take it off the W key, and I put on the Q key. I take it off the W key, and I put it on the E key, and I go right. So I can do laterals. That's how I can do my flight combat maneuvers that I like to do. When I'm sideboarding another ship and I'll rotate my ship around someone else, that's what I use. I use that to make that happen. What it does is engages the thrusters on the ship because I've changed the controls that we've talked about already. And when I move my mouse, I'm able to just easily pivot myself around. I can work a perfect circle with my ship aiming at another ship and fly around it like I'm orbiting it using these settings. My fingers move the smallest amount of space so they get the minimal amount of strain and the fastest response time between W and Q and W and E is a single key. I don't have to do some weird octopus stretching or anything else like that. Now for the vertical thrusters, when I'm landing and taking off, I take my hand off of my mouse and I use the U key and the P key to make that happen. U is up and P is down, right? Up is the word, right? So we have U is up and P is down. Those settings have been replaced in the game, I'll say, a couple of times. They're showing up as standard settings inside here. They're the ones I use. It's, I haven't changed them from what they've been. They've been like that for five years. So all the updates they've done since then, they haven't changed it since that point. Those are the bindings that I'm using. The reason why I have them like that is I also have my landing gear over there. So when I'm taking off or landing, 
from something, I'm not using that. So if I'm using my mouse, my mouse handles all those verticals. I'm moving forward or I'm flying laterally. I'm not normally flying up or down. There is a rare instance in certain situations in combat, I will take my hand off the mouse and I will use up or down thrusters to make something happen. Rarely ever. Off the mouse for a moment, back to the mouse. I can do that quickly because those two keys are my first finger and my last finger. They're spaced properly. So I can simply move my hand over U and P with these two fingers, leaving my center two fingers above I and O in that instance and make it happen rapidly. For me, I need it to be that quick because when I'm doing something, it needs to be rapid in that instance. Alternative flight controls, zero change. I didn't change anything. Flight throttle, I have it set to forward only for throttle access range. I absolutely hate it when the ship flies in reverse after I do a maneuver. I want it to do that. I will make my thrusters go in reverse to make that happen. I do not want it to do that every time I try to move. Because the whole time what happens when you're trying to maneuver your ship, you're flying backwards, it seems like. Almost all the time. Because... You can't always, in starting out, roll the ship properly into turns, and sometimes you're hitting a harder bank than the ship can actually maintain, and you'll end up going a reverse thruster because of the momentum of the ship. So to bypass that, I have thruster throttle access to forward only. I have to literally double tap reverse to throw it in reverse. It's as if I'm in a car and I have to shift it into reverse. I don't want it to automatically go into reverse using the thrusters, though I do allow the ship to go in reverse in maneuvers without the thrusters, and it will slow itself because the thrusters are constantly facing forward. It gives me more control in the ship to put them at forward only. I also have throttle increments set to continuous. So when I press it, if I let my key off, I don't want it to immediately go right back down to zero and I have to start from scratch again. I want it to gradually reduce as the momentum reduces. Otherwise, it drops too rapidly. Literally kills engines, and you got to start from the bottom again. That's no good. It's not even how it works in real life, right? The other setting that I have, which they have on here, I don't have any of the others like 75% speed, and that, a lot of other gamers and Elite will set these presets in here. I do not. The only one that I set is X, kill engines. So on my control, for some reason I got a problem, I take my center button finger right here that's normally setting on W and I'll drop it past S on the keyboard and hit X and kill engines. Emergency stop situation, right? It's now been preset in that space since that point. X is that. But if it isn't for yours, that's what I would do. My throttle, obviously, W is increase and S is decrease. If I continue S to the bottom, what will happen is it will reduce to the bottom. And then I have to press it a second time when I reach the bottom for it to start to go in reverse. So my S key becomes my reverse key. If I hold it and then tap it to continue past and go in reverse. Otherwise, it will just go to the bottom and stop at zero. And it will not continue to go in reverse. It was doing that in the original part of the game when it first came out and I could not stand it. So W and S, continuous, forward only, you're all set. You will only be flying forward unless you literally want to go in reverse based off of your flight. So, let me throw this back off and go to landing overrides. I have zero changed in this category. I have it all set exactly how it was. Flight miscellaneous, zero changes. It is exactly how it is. The only thing that I had originally changed was I used the equal keys to turn the orbital lines on and off. Orbital lines will show you exclusion zones on planets. It will show you when you've reached a gravity well on the edge. It will show you when you've reached the exclusion zone, right? The atmospheric measure so you can tell where you're at. You can use that to move. Show the orbital lines for planets. You can turn it on and off. If it's on, it shows up. You can see all the lines for everything. Some players don't want that. You can remove it. It doesn't have to be there. All those lines that show in there from the HUD can be removed, and it just shows the objects instead. We'll still label the objects when you target them. You'll still be able to see them. The only difference is the directional lines of their travel won't be there. 
There are some times when you need to know what the orbital lines are or where the exclusion zones are for stars and stuff for fuel scooping so you don't get too close and burn your ship up or drop out because you're too close. It'll kick you out of super cruise as a safety precaution in the COVAS system. So there are systems that I don't know that I might be flying to and before I go, I turn orbital lines on so I can get used to the system where the stuff is. Then I turn it back off, especially if I've been out doing exploration for quite a bit. There are some stars that you might think have a smaller exclusion zone, which is the range that you can approach it. If you don't go past the boundary closer to it, you can stay good. If you go past it, we'll kick your ship out of super cruise. An insafe location, we'll say. If you go within it, you're in the unsafe location. So at the edge, in orbital, you're safe. Inside the boundaries of that, not safe. You'll start cooking rapidly, especially if it's a really nasty star. Some stars that have a very wide range that's almost the same distance as the circumference of the star. So that's why I do that in systems that I don't know. Some real nasty ones out there that'll cook you. Neutron stars, white dwarfs being on that list. Targeting system, I changed nothing. Although in my mouse, I have a center button located here that I can click. It's the rotator, right, to scroll up and scroll down. I use that, I click it once, it will target lock an object, I click it again, it, and it will unlock that target, click it somewhere else. It's now a mandatory feature inside here, it hasn't been changed, the binding is state. It's not orange, so it hasn't changed from when they set it. Weapons, the only thing I did is firing deploys hard points I have set to on. So for some reason, I don't open up hard points, I can use the mouse to just automatically do that. Though I have a key to open up hard points and close them down without firing, if I press the fire key, right, mouse click one or mouse click two, it will automatically open them as a secondary. If I don't do that, when I click fire one or fire two, it's not going to automatically open them up if for some reason they're not. My hard points deploy when I press shift. That's how they go. And cycle between the groups with C. These are all mandatory ones that are there. No changes. I just reset this one. Cooling, I did nothing. Heat sinks fire on a V and silent running is delete. But I can also just go into the menus and turn silent running on if I need to. Heat sinks I don't typically use anyways because I build my ships. I do thermal dynamic testing. But there are some players that run them. And now in the game, there's some other modules that they put in to prevent caustic resistance. So knowing at least what this is helps you. Again, it's an easy one to reach. You drop from the D key down to V and hit it. Simple. No problem. Miscellaneous, as far as it goes, there's all these inside here. The only ones that I toggled on was microphone options. I have it set to toggle and I have it set push to talk, just like comms. Press to talk, release, not talk. Comms are closed. That's simple. Context menu in the ship I have set to off, so it doesn't constantly pop it up because it gets annoying. Rarely ever do I run with open comms on my ship. It's rare instance. If I'm out doing exploration in the middle of nowhere, I may do open comms, but it's almost never do I use it. I don't do open comms in games. It's just not a thing I do. Mode switches. So in this instance, I have directional, so we can do that, right? I have auto focus on text input field set to off because I don't want it to do that. I want those panels to stay the way they are. Focus on the panels, all this stuff on here that they've got all set. Enable camera lock on, on. So no changes as far as this is. All of these are just focuses on the panel. So when I look, that panel is the panel that I'm looking at. It doesn't try doing any kind of weird stuff, blurring the background or any of that because I hate when they do that. I hate videos that do that where they unnaturally blur the background like that's something there are camera devices that do that as well i absolutely hate that it hurts my eyes to see that i have depth perception and to ruin the natural defocus of background and make it blurred creates a disruption because everything in the background that you're looking at isn't blurred to that extent it's not a natural blur they didn't look at that properly. They blurred it beyond natural, and it creates a disruption for the eyes. It creates eye strain. Been using computers for a long time. Eye strain, no good. 
you'll get migraines, and then that leads to the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing. And you need glasses and all that fun stuff. So best not to deal with it. Head look mode. For me, on head look mode, I press J as my key. And I have it where I can look using the mouse itself, right? So I use the mouse. I have it set to on. I have the invert set to off in this instance because I'm not doing flight. Mouse sensitivity, same. Head look default state, I have it set off. I'm determining that. I don't want it to automatically move the head around. If I'm tilting my head around, I want to move it exactly how I move my mouse. My mouse is my head. It's the base of my skull. When I move my mouse, it moves me naturally in the space. Nice and fluid, no issues. I have it set to continuous. I have the access to accumulate. I have it center when an active on, so it'll automatically put my head back where I had it. When I turn it off, it automatically brings me back. I don't want to turn it off and my guy's looking this way while I'm trying to fly in hot combat. And I was like, what the frick happened to my thing? And I got to go back in and then rotate my head back. It's like I'm a little robot and I have to move it. Okay, my head's here. If I turn it here and then I had to do it, it was just a giant pain. It's much easier to just set it like this. Continuous. Accumulate. Ah, oh, it's easy. Again, head look sensitivity. It's all up to you. What speed you want. I have increased it over time. And I have head look smoothing set to on. If I don't have that, it's choppy creates a disruption and actually hurts my eyes, right, for me, because I get vertigo easily with motion stuff, moving around, it's it's difficult, a lot of motion in the game, so I would have a lot of problems if I didn't dial these in properly. So I have it set to on, so that that takes care of that problem. It doesn't do any unnatural blurring or anything like that. That's that section. Multi-crew, I did not touch anything, but I did go in and make a couple of changes. I put yaw and pitch, right, to my mouse, off and off so they match the other menu that we had adjusted to make sure that those are accurate so when i'm in multi-crew it does the same as it does when i'm not in multi-crew i don't want those to have any kind of issues flight orders on these they're all the same presets whatever you want you can tell the targets that you've disembarked from your ship like ship launch fighters that's where these categories pop in Whoever it is will do these commands. Engage at will, attack, maintain formation, whatever. For me, I'm typically pressing 4 most of the time. So they maintain the formation and stay, and I'll do 1 and 0 the rest of the time. They're flying all over. There was a time in which I changed the sequence of this and put 0 at the bottom. So that we were leaving. And I may go back in and make those changes again and start with 1 at the top. One, two, three, four, five, six, zero would be what it is. I do not allow open orders. <laughs> I'm in control of the crew. I'm the captain. So, full spectrum system scanning tool, which we've used a lot. We've done a lot of exploration in the game. All of those controls are all here. Same thing. Zoom in on target, mouse one, zoom out, mouse two. In and out. Mouse one, I zoom in. Mouse two, I zoom out. So click left, click right. Somebody who's left-handed would reverse these and make that happen for them. So that's all based off of how you like it. Arrow up and arrow down for me is the same. I have it dialed in. Tuning right and left, and I rarely ever use these keys at all. But they're in there if, if need be. Discovery scan is mouse three. Obviously, we use that. These have been defaulted at this point. The only thing that I changed, again, was the same as we do. Yaw, pitch inverted. On, on. It's got to be. Otherwise, it doesn't work. For me, I can't fly around and do what I need to do in that instance. I'm going to go back to that one setting. And make sure for some reason that didn't change. Should probably be pitch inverted. I don't know. I'll just hit cancel when I go through. It was probably pitch inverted on that one, too, just like I do down here, because I like it to be inverted. Flight controls, for me, i got to fly with it inverted. So, the detailed surface scanner, right? Close this other one down. Got to scroll up. Close that. And the last category, detailed surface scanner. We use this often, exploration again. Same thing, yaw, off, pitch, off. Now, on these, sometimes... You want to do pitch, and sometimes you want to do inverted. In this particular instance, I have it set to pitch, not inverted. 
because I'm moving the mouse around a little differently. So it's up to you, whatever you like. Sometimes you want to make it inverted and it'll flip the controls around. It's totally up to you. When I'm doing driving games, I do different things depending on what it is. Depending on the level of simulation that it has, I will make changes. I do the same thing in here, depending on what they've done. There are times in which I will put it back to inverted, and other times I will just have it as pitch. It just depends. So other than that, I'm just going to hit cancel. Discard the changes. Yes, because I'm not changing anything. I want my stuff to stay the same. Play it too much. So I'm going to hop into here, and I'm going to show you. So I'm going to go into here. Besides setting those controls, the very first thing a player should do is right here, training. The training section, you have to do the simulation, the challenge scenarios, and the videos. All three. Don't half-ass it. Somebody else isn't going to help you with this. You have to do this yourself. Training simulation starts first. There are eight of them here to go through. They cover the basics. They're very minuscule. But what they tell you in the order that they tell you, allow that to happen at the pace it is. They're not the greatest, but you'll click on it and click the tutorial and you'll go through. Every time you go through these, you complete them all, it matters that you have done this. So go through and do them. The challenge scenarios are the exact same. There's 10 of them here. Go through each one of these very specifically. You may have to go through them several times. It's whatever works for you. Once you've got it smooth and you can go through it, without any hesitation, what you feel comfortable is success. Then you move on to the next one. Make sure that you feel comfortable. That's going to be different for everyone. Maybe you do it once, maybe you do it ten times. doesn't matter. It is gameplay as if you were in the game. So if you half-ass it here, you're going to be half-ass inside the game. So if you have to do it ten times, twenty times to make it perfect, that's you. It's going to take you through different levels of threat. Harmless, competent, dangerous, elite. Everything. And there's even an introduction to VR, if you are interested. I did not do VR, of course. I can't do VR. Motion sickness. Can't have. But I did all the way up to Elite, of course. Played Elite several times on here, just because these instances will give you exactly what it would happen simulation-wise in the game. It's Stellar Forge, with the parameters set exactly the same as in the game. So if you want to do it, and do it properly when you get in, so you don't look like an idiot... <laughs> trying to fly around, just basically go through these first two sections as many times as required to make it happen. It goes through its motions and it stops. It doesn't cover everything. It covers the specific thing that it is instructing. That's why it's there. Enough to get you around. You'll learn more repetitively in the space. You want to get comfortable with these. One time, ten times, twenty times, could be a hundred times. Maybe you play that same scenario for an entire week, for a couple hours until you've got it so fluid that you can do all the keys. That's why these are there. It's so that you can get a nice memorization of all of the keys by going through each one of these specifically. You'll learn the keys that you have set up. So you have to do these to learn the keys is the conversation. Do these, learn the keys. You do these, you learn the keys. That's basically why they're there. They're not going to do anything else beyond that. Challenge scenario, same thing. It's going to show you the range so that you're not panicked in the motion of doing stuff. It's going to give you enough variety to each of these so you can see what it is. Instances, very small, very isolated specifics. I wish that Frontier went in and expanded these and added some other variances to this, because this isn't enough. This is just the basics. It's not enough. A new player could use more than what's here, but they haven't done so. You can go in and make some options, right? And add some other layers. They've got menu options here. They could add more to this. They didn't, but they could. So let's go back. There's videos here that you can take a look at. Each of these videos are accurate to the space's current mechanics. So if you play the video, you'll see it in motion. So if you go back and you say, oh, I'm doing this training simulation on docking and travel. You're having a hard time. No problem. You have docking here. You can watch the video. You have travel here. You can watch the video. The video will show you what it is that they are showing you 
and having you do the motions for. Like I said, people learn differently. Some people need visual instruction, some people need audible instruction, and some people need tangible instruction. They've tried to include those in here. They're okay. They can improve, but they're at least here enough for a new player to learn the basics. So once you've done this in combination, all of these work together, and you will take your pilot assessment. Once you've taken the pilot assessment, you're inside the game. It's just like driver's instruction. If you skip all this and think you know and hop into pilot assessment, but you don't have the keys, you might be doing pilot assessment several times. And it can get frustrating because it's very specific. So do these in order. Relax, chill. It's just like driver's training. You'll go through the motion and you'll practice. Even if you've drove a car, you've got keys that you need to memorize. You need them to be extension of yourself so your brain isn't thinking. It's going to go subconscious. and All that stuff is going to happen. I need to fly left. You're not. What key is that? It just doesn't. That takes time and practice. That's what this is. You practice here to do that. When you're done with all of that and you've completed it and you have your space, I recommend not going into open to start with. I recommend that you go into solo play for a span of time. Not even in group sessions or anything else. Solo play. So that you are in the space and can get a feel for what it is you're doing without any other discrepancies or distractions or anything else. Because there's variances that happen when other players are in the same space with you. If you're brand new and you wing up with someone else who's a higher level than you, that could cause a disruption to your progress. It's not going to make it easier for you. It will actually make it harder, more detrimental. Solo play to get comfortable. I typically play in solo play. That's what I've been playing in almost the entire time that Elite has been out. Rarely ever did I play in open. And I only very minuscule ever play in private. Very minuscule. So when you enter into the screen, you're going to start off, you're going to have your sidewinders, what you're going to be set. No problem. Doesn't matter what ship. Starport services is the very first thing you're going to get your mission that you're going to get initially. Mission is going to take you somewhere. So we already know where that is. You're inside the starter location where only other players in starter location can access. So you are still safe, as can be, inside the cradle, more or less, of training, still. You're going to go through that very precisely and not skip a beat. I was actually inside starter location for the better part of a year. How far can I go with it? Once you get a rank, it will eject you out. So it's best to look at the game at range so that you don't climb rank. You're just trying to accumulate, very specifically, 1 million credits. It takes a little bit of time to do that. But if you do the missions that are available, you'll see how that stacks up quickly. You can do it in a day without a problem. Easy to do. But you take the time. You've got your training. You've got the buttons. Now you're out there. You do that for a bit. Once you've done that you've played around in it. You're inside the starter location getting a feel for trans between systems, you're leaving, you're entering, you're going inside star ports, practicing landing, practicing leaving, all that stuff. We've done that a million times on the channel, so you can see it in real time on any video that we have. But on here, in starter location, you're still in a rental ship, so it doesn't matter what happens to that vessel. That vessel is expendable there. The vessels you have there are expendable. Do not put any currency into that ship. You simply stack up the dollars. It's the sidewinder that you're in, you stay in the sidewinder. You leave it as it sets and do nothing to it. Zero. I recommend going into the missions on the mission tab. If you've completed the first one, it's going to send you to another system. It'll walk you through everything you need to do. You'll land, you'll distribute the data, because that's what it is, drop it off. There'll be another mission usually after that that says take this trade and trade this over to here. There'll be another one that'll say you need to equip this and do this. So it'll walk you through the basics. 
It doesn't link you any longer because it's been some time since I've been in there doing that, clearly. I've been playing it since it came out. So they've made some changes to some of that. That's no problem. It still covers at least the three basic options that you have for the game. It may say go to a nav beacon and take down a ship. That Sidewinder is equipped with everything you need to make it successfully happen. It's, again, an extension of you already getting your pilot's license. All flying around, no problem, with no hiccups, you'll get other missions. So once you get into this menu, and you have options, you've got all these other factions and powers inside the starter location, we care nothing about anything in here except for transportation. What you're going to look for, like I said, are these courier jobs in which you're going to take and move data around. You're not delivering physical stuff, though you can. I would recommend waiting until later because it's more valuable to you, we'll say, to wait until after you're out of starter location to do it. It's easier to just transport these couriers around. So grab a few. In Odyssey now, they've tagged these by color coordination. Greens are easy, yellows are more difficult, and red is obviously danger. So this one here, you can see, it has a threat level 4. It goes all the way up to 10, that's the maximum, basically, in the game. When it goes up to 8, really, there's going to be more. There's going to be waves of them. So we don't even bother with those, unless we have assistance or we're really tanked out. Threat level 4 is a push. The more risky the adventure, the higher the reward. So that's a weigh-in option, right? I would say start at the bottom first get your comfortable range. What do you feel comfortable doing? Can I take this mission and do this? Am I good at outrunning other ships? It's going to teach you how to do that. I take the ones that are in the green. I stack up quite a few. The green ones, no one's looking for you. You're carrying data that no one cares about. You do not have physical cargo, so pirates will not follow you. They do not care about this data. At threat level zero, no one cares. You're just a ship flying around, a sidewinder. So you fly around unimpeded with no distractions, no delays, right? Because we're talking about speedrunning this a bit. We're trying to get out of the starter location and get out where we can get some ships and do some stuff. This is a section in the game that I said that they need to fix. In the starter location, what they should have done, frontier-wise, is put all the damn ships in here. That is the very first thing they should have done. They should have put players in every possible combination of ships, like I said, it doesn't matter in the starter location what ships you are flying in or what ships you have, because when you leave, you don't leave with any of them anyways. It doesn't matter. So they should have all the ships in here with all the different variances of options for the game. If they wanted you to go do some mining, they could have added that in there. In the starter location, the company who is employing you could provide the ship for you to use, leaving your Sidewinder there. You would take their vessel that they provided with the correct loadout so that you could see how that works. It would explain it in brief and allow you to take that ship and do it. That's how it should be. They didn't do that. Frontier-wise really dropped the ball, but it could be a thing. Because we know it doesn't matter. Because what happens when a player leaves that space, they want to go get the ship that Belly's got. They have no idea how any of those ships fly all the way up to it. They're in a hurry and they go do a speed run on the game right to maximum. And they don't even know how to fly their ship. They could be an elite level pilot and suck at flying. They missed it all. Work circles around them in a sidewinder and they're really blasting with their fully engineered ship, but they're nothing to you. And you're a rookie pilot. You could blow them up and they gotta go get another ship. Why would they be pissed? I've had it happen. They're awful upset. So, in the game, currently, these courier missions keep you off the radar. Like I've always talked about before, you'll get influence. There's a lot of times you'll have range to that. Influence is for the faction. It's not for you. It ups their impact to Stellar Forge in the game. Reputation, on the other hand, if this was to say reputation, that's your measure between you, the player, and that faction. What is your acquaintance with them? They enjoy your presence, they enjoy your capability, or do they not? There are some factions that your reputation is negligible at best. They do not like you, you've worked against them so much that they send forces after you. We have that. 
taken out a lot of pirate factions and caused them to be upset. It will get in the red. The bar over here on this right-hand side underneath this person, the nemesis here, we got Vizier Sammy Wilkinson as an example. You can see I am cordial with him. Typically you start in this boundary here. He just knows me. Neutrality is the starting point, center point. But I've gained some friendly nature with him. I'm cordial with him. We've done a little bit, not much. If I was to work against this, we'd go down past that bar into this next category. They will send bounties after you in this category. They're not super upset, but they definitely don't like you. When you get down into this last bar, you have active opposition. This person is now your enemy in the game. They'll work against you very directly, and they will do that continuously until you remove their presence in the game. Their influence would then have to be reduced to zero in order for them to stop sending out targets against you. We'll continue. So what I like to do, influence is the focus to begin with inside starter location. When I'm outside of starter location, I weigh the option. Do I want to allow this faction here to have influence in Stellar Forge increase? Or do I not care about that? Do I want my reputation with them to increase, which unlocks more missions, more payouts, more goodies? Those are the two sides, influence or reputation. Now you can see on the left-hand side here under this financial section, even though I'm getting paid, I'm also increasing my reputation at a minuscule amount and I'm increasing their influence at a minuscule amount. So I'm still having it happen, either way. You can see how the influence here varies with the influence here if I just focus on influence. You can see how the financials obviously change. So like I said, in the initial space of the game, when you're in starter location, financial is the primary. I don't care about my reputation with that faction, and I do not care about the influence, because once you leave starter location, you cannot go back. And those powers in starter location do not expand outside of starter location anyways. They're only starter location powers in that instance. So who cares about that? Your, mini your minuscule interaction with them, we'll say, is purely financial compensation. You're delivering their data like the mailman. You can load up several of these courier missions. They have no weight, right? So you could do a 10, however many, right? It will tell you when you've reached your maximum amount of courier jobs. What I like to do is I take a courier job and I make sure that I do not have to come back to get my payout. I want to make sure that I deliver the data to that location and that is where I get paid. You can see on here, this does not require me to come back. That is key. It says you will receive your reward upon delivery. So when I arrive at that system, I'm getting paid at that system. That's what I want. I want to pick up the jobs that where I go, I don't come back. Because I don't plan on coming back. I only plan on continuing to move through that space to the very edge of starter location. By the time I'm done doing them in sequence from one base to the next, one star system to the next, I will have a million credits in no time and I will be able to leave. When I leave, all of those have been completed, because you don't want to leave any open, and I then vacate that space. I don't have to worry about delivering any products, or going and locating them from somewhere, anything, and none of that BS. It takes too long, it's too much. I'm a new player, it's not worth it. Non-tangible. If you want to, you can do combat at nav beacons in those locations and do bounty hunting. But I have found that it progresses too quickly. And you leave the space too rapidly. And you don't have enough ship to back it up. So you've missed out on the more important pieces of the game. Flying from location to location. And docking in and out of star bases. And navigating those menus quickly and efficiently. That is far more beneficial than setting on a nav beacon and popping ships. Because that's not the focus of the game anyways. It's more beneficial to be able to navigate jumps between systems repetitively using your buttons, getting used to it, and moving through the menus, which these will do properly. Courier missions move you through the menus 
in a consistent pace, sticking with one type of menu option, you're continuously doing the same thing over and over, and that's how you learn things more efficiently. That's the easiest way to make that happen. That's why it's set up like that. That's why I suggest to do it. It's the most efficient way. Because they don't have other ships, it's not worth it to fart around with the rest. It's going to take so long for you to do anything. Courier is the fastest, most efficient, and most beneficial when you leave. Because when you leave, you know how to jump between star systems fluidly, with zero issue. You can dock at star ports of varying kinds, because it's going to move you around, including planetary landings. Every combination you're going to get doing courier jobs efficiently. You're going to be able to navigate the menus inside and out efficiently through all of that without any hesitation. Three basic most used things in the game. Outside of specialty stuff, combat, exploration, that, I don't care about that. That is irrelevant. These provide you with the foundational elements that you need. Once you leave, then you can do the rest. No problem. I was in a Sidewinder for a whole year doing all the other stuff in the game. Never even got out of that loner ship. I left it as the only ship. Stacked up the currency and never bought a single thing. I only flew that ship as it set. I did not leave it. I did not change it in any way. For an entire year. Billions of credits, elite level, and everything. So it can be done. Trust me. Once you've done all of that, you'll be at a million. You only need a million, and when you have it, you leave starter location. I'm going to show you where to go, because the map sucks. You would never know, and I got swindled into it twice, and it was annoying. So starter location is all the way over here. You can see these are starter location systems, these here. All these ones that I have here are the ones that I went to. Love these systems. Draw me, Matit, right? Shower, Leofail, Orna, Azoth. All these starter location systems love. When you are done, the very closest system to exit safely in solo mode without pirate activity being a major problem is this system right here, AY Indy the game through so many times of all the different possible combinations of leaving starter location AY Indy is the best you leave and go to AY Indy it has what you need it's low security which is what you want refinery colony perfect low population federation is still having presence here so you go to AY Indy straight up from AY Indy, you will leave. You're going to fly for a bit. Hence the reason the practice is important. Soul rests in this center point here. Right? You can see it. Soul is here. So from the starter location, it's very close. We're not going anywhere near it. You leave all that behind and simply system jump and system jump and system jump and system jump until you get to Limati, which is over in here. So you leave AY Indy and fly directly to Limati. The fastest path, you can see there's not a lot of stars here. It is a cluster to itself. It's completely isolated. There's a giant gap here all the way around. There's nothing by you. You're in an isolated cluster of stars and systems. These systems right here, what you can do is you can make several million credits in just this cluster of stars right here. This is the fastest, most efficient way to get yourself up in rank in the game as quickly as you can, this location. Alternatively to that, you can simply come here, medium security, it's independent, dictatorship, no problem, and fly around to these different systems locally here, all close to each other. On the way there, you're going to make enough traveling only 
doing nothing else, just flying from AY Indy to Lamadi, you'll make enough currency just doing that, flying to these systems here, one after the other, doing nothing but simply flying in and leaving. Going to starports to get fuel if you don't have a fuel scoop by now, no problem. If you don't have a fuel scoop, no problem. You can dock and get fuel. Flying to these will get you enough information and, and enough currency to make a good decision. Fly to this system, LTT8750. It's massive. It's got 3.1 billion. Biggest. Pretty good. Agricultural and terraforming. Build yourself a ship. Small class, don't build medium. Be smart. Don't spend your money. Because you're leaving. When I left the system, I flew specifically out. You can see I have them marked. I did not take these off. I leave these on. These are the exact locations I left and always leave to. Mark them all the same every time. You can see Liamati, right? LTT 8750. We've left, flew around. Blotter system by far is the absolute best system. Elnair is secondary to it. Elnair used to be the best, but Blotter is the best. You fly to Blotter system, you can build yourself one badass ship. Medium or, or a large class at this point. Do some hot ass combat there. You can make a mill at the nav beacon every 10 minutes. Flying. You've done exploration to this point. You know the basics of doing your in and outs of systems and landing at a variety of starports and planets. It's time for some combat. Blotter system will not let you down. There's a million different possible combinations of signal sources there that you can lock onto and go into. You can start playing around with the rest of the game and figure out what it is that you like to do in Elite. You can do a full range. You don't have to lock yourself into a single thing. You can do every aspect of the game in any ship you want. It doesn't matter. I had a blotter system in a Sidewinder for an entire year. Combat. It is fast, maneuverable. You can equip it with a variety of different weapon loadouts that work at a nav beacon. You will learn how to pick your targets. The longer you're there, you'll know what can you survive and what can't you. You'll get used to the maneuvers, used to the buttons. Because that all matters. Once you've got that down, you can move on past this cluster of stars. Right? Starter location, you've moved out. You can start to take a look at the rest of the three hundred billion stars to four hundred billion stars if you want to fly all the way to the outside. It's about three hundred billion that you can access easily. There's another 100 billion stars that are way off grid that require some special loadouts. All these outskirts here, you need some special builds to get to these. There are stars in here and they accumulate rapidly up to about 100 billion. So the 300 billion are quite easily accessible to any ship. The other 100 billion of the 400 billion are risky. So of that, you have a lot that you can explore here. I hung around in Blotter system for a long time. You can stack up cash quickly, million every 10 minutes. What happens when you ally with that system, it's military aspect, you'll start to unlock systems, it'll send you to locations, missions will come to you based off of your capacity. So as you get good, Stellar Forge recognizes your level of expertise and will send missions your way. The star system will start to notify you of things that you need. It will say, Hey, such and such has a mission here. You'll see it in the menus. So if I go to Blotter System, right? I pull up the map so you can see. You can do what you need here. Very, very isolated. You could mine here. There's a lot of trade and travel that happens. There's a landable planet that has a ring. There's an outpost here. Shablezzle Blezzle Station. That's how I say it. It's a ways away from the nav beacon, so you have to fly. That's why I purposefully picked this one, because you have to do some work here. If you hunt the nav beacon and make a mill, you decide to stay a little longer or whatever and make more, when you fly back, all those bounties somebody has an interest in, so they're going to try and interdict you. You're going to have all that fun. 
and you have to fight the per person or try to evade them and get back into super cruise and continue to fly to Blazer Blazer Station, <laughs> right? So it's going to give you a range. You have to make the decision and how far you need to go. There is a planet that you can go down to with your SRV and do some mining down there. With what is available in this system, you'll be able to do everything for engineering that you require should you want to build your ship using engineering. You can get it all here in this system. Mission-wise, it will take you to the locations that has what Blotter does not. Once you rank up here, it will automatically give you the rest. The engineers will come to you. You will not have to go to them. And you will be stocked up well and good on everything that you need, maybe even at max. With scanning vessels, getting the data from scanning vessels directly, just clicking on a ship will give you information that you need. Going into the signal sources, like we talked about. All of those varieties of signal sources appear here in this system. It's a military system. There's a lot of trade and travel moving through here. The ringed planets have all the different varieties of mining options that you need. There's surface. There's ring. There's asteroid. You have everything. There are a variety of stars, so you can see the range of what they have. There's a variety here. Al Nair had a bunch, but it got nuked because the other stars ate the rest. So it's very isolated. This is your pocket of space. This is where you are. Resource extraction sites. You can learn to fly in the asteroid fields, just like the nav beacon, and do combat in there so you can get good. There are times in which conflict arises here, and you'll have conflict zones like we did on stream. It'll show you all that. Blotter system contains all of that. It is the fastest route, the closest to, right? It's literally right there. Now I have, obviously, covered all of this distance all the way out. I am actually setting in here, currently in the game. That's almost 20,000 light years away. It's quite a range. It's a lot of money. I'm in the billions out here. You don't have to do that. You don't have to use Neutron Star Highway, which kind of cuts across this line, different ships, and they'll tell you where the next one is, and get to Colonia, which is over here, or fly to the center of the galaxy, or any of that stuff. You don't have to do that. You could stay in here, Stack up and build what you need, and then go. In the game currently, most of the stuff they do is tied here. All the Thargoid activity is here. Thargoid, Thargoid, Thargoid. There's motherships all over, and every system around these Thargoid locations of the Titans are influx with Thargoids. You can load your ship out to take out Thargoids. Sidewinders can hunt Thargoids. Up to quite a sizable Thargoid, given the combat skill. You can make it happen, even in a sidewinder. So once you get this section here, you've eliminated the basics. Then you can go and do the rest. Easily just leave. Every one of these sectors you cross is like 10 million easily. And just fly and honk with a fuel scoop on. Doing nothing but flying. You could go to these nebulas and explore them. There are some like Omega Neb and Eagle Neb. That has civilization there enough that you could move your operations there outside of engineering. So before you go, I recommend that you buy whatever you have in triple kit. Hence the reason to stock up what you're doing here. As quickly as you can, but efficiently, not too fast, not too slow. Efficiency. Those are the locations you can do it the best. Right now I'm up in this little quadrant near the weird system. Ran in G18018. This is where we're at currently in the game, up in here. Just another little pocket. If I go to this system right here, where we're at, right? Where Planet Vulcan is here. It's where we are. It's very minuscule. If I zoom into this, you can see how this map works. These lines, this is important on how this travel works. You can see that this is a central hub. There's many lines of travel to it, whereas others don't have as many lines of travel. The star has the most. You can see it branches off quite a many directions. Spider webs out. Trade and travel is coming in from many directions to here. 
something happened and caused a disruption. The system's having an issue. So when I play in Legacy mode, it's a little easier on these maps than it is in Odyssey. Because in Legacy mode, I can find these central stars easier. Right? You can see it kind of looks like a little uh, dandelion feather puff sort of thing when it goes to sea. Dandelion's a flower. Kind of looks like that. The central hub star. If I was to switch over and take a look at this one over here, Arrow Buddy, let's say, and I come over here to this one, you can see there's three lines. Not a central hub. This thing doesn't have in all directions travel. So no good. If I fly over here to this one, lots of lines, lots of travel, right? This is a central hub. Player factions should not have control of these things. Player factions should only be able to have access to this. It has some problems in the game. We get into that in a future stream. This one here, we're just covering the basics. This is the extent of player factions, these outskirts. That's where it should be. It's not currently. So when you hop into these central hubs, you're going to have different missions that are going to get you to be able to go to these other locations. You find a central hub. All of these that connect to it will gain you currency quickly to make sure that these are also secure. You can see that there is no trade and travel to certain stars, though they're there. You can see how that works. Like, Aranin doesn't hop over to Morgor, right? Morgor's here, Aranin's here. There's no trade and travel line between these two. But you could alter that by doing trade and travel between Aranin and Morgor very directly and repetitively. Courier or physical, tangible objects back and forth will alter this and create a trade line of travel between this point and this. These are ease of access through which space, which is the space between star systems that they navigate using the FSD that they engineered from Thargoids. You can change these by traveling them manually knowing that each time you jump this, it's going to be different. It's going to move until it perfects trade and travel between here. Once you do it enough, other ships in the game, Stellar Forge, will take notice, and it will start to do that. So if you have a system that you've traveled between, you can see there's no line between these two. If I travel between these two here and make that happen over and over again, it will get a line. There are some systems that these lines are not as thin as this. They get thicker. They get more durational because you've changed it. A single commander can change the face of the galaxy in this game. You can do all kinds of stuff, whatever you want. But everything that you do has a measure of success and fail. You've done something that you shouldn't do. It will catch up to you. Trust me. So you want to make sure that you're moving around very precisely between comfort zone for you. And that will be different based off of each commander. And we come back to the main menu once again. That's the map. Which should have been perfected at this point. So when you come into these, uh, obviously we got the basics, right? Contacts. If I've got things that I need to cash out, I come in here and these people will cash out currency related items. If I run into a problem, legal facilities can help out. Mercenary facilities can help out to an, a point. Combat bonds are for combat locations. Administrative is typically what you deal with the most. You're going to do pretty much anything within that system should be relative to the administrative contact. You would come up into this menu. If you have intel packages to deliver, they would be there. If you have codex discoveries from planets, if you found something before someone else did, if you've confirmed another commander's finds, it will come to the Codex. If you've destroyed other ships, bounties here can be cashed out. If you have finds from the system, they should be here. We ran into a glitch the other day. They should be able to be done within the system. If they cannot, legal facilities can handle that. Legal facilities usually handle the fines and bounties on yourself or others. You can do that, depending. There's a range to it. Search and rescue is specialty stuff. Finding things when you answer those signal sources. There are things that you can also find inside here besides these ships. You might find wreckage components that you pick up that they may have an interest in. Cryopods may be there. 
there are ships that you destroy that may drop cryopods. All of that can be done through here. Now that being said, we'll pause for a sec. Certain ships will drop cargo that you can get, and other ships will drop cargo that's illicit or illegal. It is up to you if you decide to pick it up, but know full on well that if it's not good, it's just like the real world as far as that goes. Certain factions will not enjoy that being in your presence, and other factions will not care, depending on where you go. If you're carrying cargo that you shouldn't be, anarchy systems don't really pay attention to it, but certain political powers and systems that are tied to where you are at will definitely have a problem. Which brings us to the commodity market. When you have physical objects on your vessel, food, fuel, different things you've mined, whatever it is, physical stuff, you can come into the commodities market and see if they would like to purchase it or if they have already increased their volume to an amount. We'll show you. Green things mean they have an abundance. Red things means they're low. They're running low as far as they're concerned. Gold is a problem, right? Or they don't want it. Low, do not want. Right? That's their range. Sell, on the other hand, will measure it a little differently. Their demand is measured. Green, I need. I need 28 of these. Red, I've got 262 more than I want. I don't want these. I'm selling them low. These two menus, buy and sell, measure together. So if I come into this instance... They say they do not want this item. It says there's 262 extra of this. So if I want a Smokey and the Bandit this thing, beer is a thing that they do not want, but they do not sell. Don't see it, so I can't buy it. It's not here. They have too much. I can see on the right-hand side over here how these systems have some variations here. You can see where some of this stuff has a higher value. If I go to any item, we'll change that right-hand menu and show me potentially where these increase and decrease. Now, there's third-party tools, obviously, that players have used. I refuse to use third-party tools to make the game play. Half. Not doing it. It needs to be in the game. Frontier should have outsourced those third-party entities and put what they can do, clearly, in the space in the space here literally because this isn't as accurate as those third parties were able to maintain it's decent but it's not great we'll give you an idea so if i click on these microbial furnaces as an example they have 222 right currently in the space they're selling them for 595 in this instance a little bit above galactic average they pay but not much there's other systems over here on the right hand side you can see al Luin here pays an extra 726 not 160. it's not over the amount that's here a lot of people get confused that is the amount that they're paying over this here is the amount that they're paying Right hand, left hand. Local system, systems away. Based off of the galactic average. The average is across the active space of civilized location. There are some off-grid ones that do not measure to this accurately at all. They're really bad about having that be accurate. So I deal with this only in a guideline. I don't take this as factual. I take it as a guide, I'll take a look, and use that to fine-tune it. That's why I use my pilot logs. I got them over on my Patreon page. They're not behind a paywall or nothing, I just made them. They're easy to keep track of this information. You make a little note. There you go, you've got it. You know what system's selling what. It is very durational, so it only lasts for a certain period of time. I give it a few hours of gameplay and it will change. So if you're traveling, it's going to take you a bit to get there. If you're going to look at it today and think it's the same tomorrow, not the case. Recheck it. It's going to change. A lot of people work this very much directly. They will go in here and do serious trade and travel and make some serious dollars, right? They got a lot of videos for that. Billions of credits in an hour or whatever. Great. I typically don't do trade in physical objects. I typically do non-tangible 
career has never let me down. But when I do mining, I do bring that in. If I do signal source and I have stuff that's legal cargo, then I do bring it in. There are times in which I care about how much that is and other times which is like, I got this for free, so I don't care if it's 20 bucks. It's 20 bucks. <laughs> so it really doesn't matter. All depends on the level for the game for you, how you want to do it. The shipyard, which again, going through the motions, you should be fairly accurate with how this works. When you're at a location where you have ships, your ships will appear. There they are. You can hold 40 ships at this local location. As far as I can see, I have not seen a limitation to the number of ships you can have in the game. There's really no variance. The location can only hold 40. Modules are the same. I haven't seen a limitation, at least as far as I have been concerned. I haven't reached one. There may be a cap there. There may be a cap on ships. Frontier may put that in. I don't know. I didn't go that far. Not a requirement. I don't fly around on a bunch of ships. I have my own squadron and I limit myself to it purchasable ships it will automatically list which ones are available at the location we'll give you the data on everything you can see the ship it'll pull up the picture of it takes it a bit you can see it it gives you some information the information can weigh heavily on the decision for the vessel what i like to look at is what is it capable of doing how many people can fly in it besides myself so if it has more than one seat you can take other people your other friends could go inside your ship even at range they can fly around in your ship with you, though they can't interact in the way that we would like yet. We've pitched that to Frontier quite a lot. They're still within the vessel, so what you do, they gain a percent. You share the wealth in that instance directly in a single ship. So someone else with a different ship that's better than the one that you have could assist in that matter. You're a ride-along, right? You're in the passenger seat given an assist. There's also ships that have the option to put a fighter bay on, which would give the secondary person on the ship, another player, access to be able to leave the ship on another ship, a little offshoot drone, that they're remotely controlling. It's not that they're tangibly on it, so when it explodes, your friend's not exploded. They're still on your ship. They didn't go anywhere. Unless your ship explodes and you're both got to get picked up in crowd pots. <laughs> But the fighter ship that gets disembarked from there doesn't actually have a tangible person on it. It's remotely controlled from the vessel. They do that in that instance, simulation. Different ships, different range as far as how many seats. This one has three, this one has two. Fighter bay compatible, fighter bay compatible, neither compatible. Single pilot ship, right? No fighter bay, no multi-crew. This one here has multiple seats, so two people can go in, but no fighter bay. There's a range. It's got different combinations, depending on what you want to do. The ships have different loadouts. It tells the different size requirements. Large ships can't land at outposts. They don't have outpost landing pads for large. That's why I suggest stick to small or medium, because then you can always find a landing pad at any place in the game that you fly around in. Get comfortable with flying around in a small ship. They have combat ships specifically that can hold their own to some stuff that you'd be very surprised. Viper Mark III and Viper Mark IV can handle some real tanky stuff. I can take out a Federal Corvette, which is a very high tank ship. I can take out a Type 10, fully loaded, even engineered. In either of those two ships, I got a lot of flight. We'll say hours, but capacity to pull some serious moves out of these two vessels. The Mark III is the fastest ship in the game. The Mark IV is pretty tanky for a ship in its class. But you can upgrade and do medium. I stick with Lacon ships. That's what I like. I'm a brand kind of person. I flew around on every ship. I fly every ship in the game. And make my choice of what ships that I enjoy the most. There are changes that I would have made to certain vessels if I was the developer and then I would fly them more often. I don't like them, so I don't fly them. Everyone's going to like a different ship. I don't fly a ship because Billy flies one or Susie. I fly it because I like it. I like to fly in the Viper because when I open up gun points when I'm doing combat, the guns are blazing right next to me and it looks badass. It's awesome. But that doesn't mean somebody else wants to do that, right? Maybe they want something else, right? Maybe they want to fly around in the Adder, right? I've seen some Adders do some serious moves and pull off some serious combat and clear out a resource extraction site like nobody's business. There's some commanders that perfect it. There's some commanders that fly around on a Sidewinder and never leave it right? Different streamers do different things, right? 
The Eagle's a good option. Upgrade from Sidewinder. I took the Eagle and I flew around with that. It's very combat ready. can also do very quick trade and travel. There are upgrades to these vessels, different grades, as far as these basic ones. An Eagle has an Imperial Eagle. Allying with that faction, gaining rank in the game is all stuff that happens later. With the factions that will also unlock ships. These ships are not held behind a rank grind, more or less. You don't have to do missions and increase your rank with a faction. You simply increase your capacity as far as currency and combat or exploration or mining. Personal interest. What do you need? And that ship will be available across the board somewhere here. Like I said, you can do everything in the game in every single ship, so it doesn't make any difference. It's personal. What do you like? You'll never know that unless you fly them. They easily trade in, just like if you took a car and traded it in, so don't think, oh, I'm out all the money. No. There are some locations that pay even higher for a ship that has a very good track record. I had a ship that I flew around in and did some hot combat, never lost it ever. It had a very good track record. When I traded it in, it was almost three times as much as what I paid for that ship because of its track record. It itself had built its own legacy in the game, and they paid me more for that ship because of it. I actually seen the ship then be reinserted into the game. The NPC characters were flying in it, flying it around and doing stuff in it wasn't just another ship. I know because it was in the middle of nowhere and they don't sell that ship there. It doesn't pop up on those reticles, we'll say. Not a ship that's there. So they took it and they used it. System security was flying around it for a bit and then it was back on the market and someone else was flying another NPC. Another faction bought it up. So there's other layers to the game that a lot of people don't pay attention to. There's other things in there that they don't know. So all that is the basics. The other option is when you're out there doing systems and honking and doing your thing, every system you fly to, you're going to get cartographic data from that, even if you don't honk. Just scooping the star will get that star that you immediately pop into. Boom, I'm in the system. We'll pay you money. Flying the ones that I suggest will give you more than enough currency to stack up to get a ship. That's why I selected them specifically, and I select them the same every time I go through and start from zero and play the game. It gives you the very precise amount that you need. I say a mil before you leave starter location for a reason. Because modules, besides the ship, cost money. And it gives you enough variance there to load out the ship as you require. And also rebuy it, because you don't fly the ship unless you have enough money to rebuy the ship should something happen, or you lose everything and have to start over, which would suck. But honking, or even flying, you'll get cartographic data. You can sell this at almost any location. It's been very rare instances that I've had a system that you could not, at some location there, sell cartographic data. There are times in which it isn't. There are systems where it isn't. But it's very rare that that occurs. You can sell that and it stacks up very good. So. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, so what you want to do when you sell off the ship, when you're doing it, if you're in, in doing that like that, you don't have the wide range of variety, right? So you're in there doing a thing. It just depends on where you are. There are systems that do not carry a vessel. They have never seen that ship before in that system. It has never been on trade and travel, it has never been anywhere in their system. You've been there the first time. It has happened, and that's what happened for me. I was in a system that had never seen that vessel before. They have never seen one in any way, shape, or form with that track record. Everything that was on my ship, I sold with it. But you are correct. You can take your modules off and sell your ship back at a 10% loss regardless. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where it is. 10% because you used it. I had a ship that I never left the starport. I bought it. I didn't do anything with it. I never changed a single module. I never touched anything. I bought it. 
and immediately sold the ship back. They immediately took off the 10%, even though I did nothing with it, but simply sat in the seat so I could take a look at what it looked like in the cockpit directly. So, when you're out flying around and doing your thing, that's why I say to pay attention to what is available in that location. A lot of times, when you get yourself ranked up, they will pay you more for things. And I was. Ranked up. Full-on ally. You'll get paid more for things that you wouldn't normally get paid for not doing that. I will. In a minute. Okay, I'll hop in there. So, like I said, it matters when you are doing all of the game. Not just doing a piece of it. So if I was to buy, let's say, in here, a Sidewinder, as an example. Here's the Sidewinder. And I buy it. It has what it has on it. That's it. Once I leave with the purchase of this ship, I then go into my modules. I'll leave the menu. I'll go over to it. Go back out of this. I'll go over here to my outfit. I can take whatever modules are on that ship and I could save them if I want to. When you're allied, when you're doing different stuff with the system, the more your rank goes up with them, the more they pay you to do things. But in the background, mechanically, they also pay you more market fair price on things. I can get access to system locations I've never been to. They will sell me the cartographic data because I'm allied with them. So the status will go up. They will also increase how much they pay me for things over someone else who's in the same system. The ship, the modules, all of that stuff is all factored under that same category. Rank is not the same as reputation, so to speak. So you could be elite, and they could be rookie pilot. That doesn't give you the edge in that instance completely. What matters more is your reputation with that faction. You can gain rank, that is a way to do it, but your reputation, your influence directly between you and the power that's in place at that location is what allows the market to have a swing with what you are doing. It's not talked about a lot in the game, because a lot of people don't even do that. They don't pay attention to it or move around in the space, but it is there. You can make it happen. When I'm in a system, what I like to do, like I showed you on the map, is explore all of those locations outside of the current one and look at the entire logistics of that trade network. Make allies around you. So when you're in the space, you have the maximum range of potential there. The market prices will be more in your favor. The purchase prices of ships will reduce. The higher you are allied with different factions, Mission price goes up. Bounty fees go up. There are modules that can do that. You can make bounties go higher by having a specific module equipped. You can scan and see if the entity is wanted in more systems than the one that you initially have access to. Outside of the current system. But that's minuscule in comparison to being allied with other entities that when you scan that person, they also have an interest in them outside of that module, and they will pay you sometimes triple for that target outside of what it would have normally been in, an, in any other instance for a target. I've had it happen side by side and went through it to test it all out at range. It's quite a variance. Stellar Forge has a lot of capacity to do different combinations. It is an active game space very active game space. It's doing a whole lot of things in the background. They're not tangibly measured, we'll say, where someone says, oh, well, this is a thing, and every person goes in and does it. Not the case. You have to do a lot of different stuff in there and be around, not speed running because Billy Joe goes and does something. That's not a thing you want to do. Play the whole space, and you'll be able to gain access to more things than they will. You're not going to speed run it and get to that point and bypass everything and expect to have everything unlocked and I win. Not going to happen. So, that being said, give me a second. 
click on something here. And I will continue. have some notes. I don't want to miss anything. One second. this off, Pull that over, Pull this over, close that, pull this back up. All right, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Rank and rep both will give you benefits, but the one measures to Stellar Forge directly. So it will change the impact and the range of your interaction. If you focus on the power's influence, and I'll go back for one second. We covered this already, but I'll, I'll go back for a second. Make sure that you guys understand how it works. When you go into a power, it doesn't matter which one. There's going to be a range. could be 15 people in here. It depends on the scale of the system. When you go into it, like I said, the right-hand side here, influence. And the missions have influence. The influence is the power's capacity inside Stellar Forge directly. If you do not choose a mission, right, you can see the range, depending on who it is. If you do not choose a mission that increases influence, then that mission is very specifically for you and you alone in that instance. It's your measure only, isolated from Stellar Forge, between you and that power directly. Those missions are the ones that have the largest sway of the background simulation and how your measure between you and that power specifically happens. That's how I got access to be able to get a higher rate for ships and a lower rate on my rebuy cost. It costs me less to replace my ship than it would have been if I did not do that in the game. So the measure of ally an enemy in the space changes it. If I go to a system that I am enemies with, they're not going to give me a good payout on my ship there. There's no generic background stuff happening. You're going to get screwed. They're going to pay you nothing. <laughs> or not allow you to dock. Or they're going to blow your ship up, and your rebuy cost there will be three times as much, or whatever. Whatever they decide to do. Because they will definitely sway that in their favor. Slider scale of success and fail is very present in Elite Dangerous, as far as that's concerned. So, influence is them, reputation is you and them. Very specifically. So we go back to outfit. Yeah, player factions. Player factions measure inside Stellar Forge isn't the same as the factions inside Stellar Forge. Player factions have less capacity and less proper measure inside the game mechanically. So there's things that even a player faction will never be able to do in the game. Frontiers actually went in and made some hard locks inside there to restrict player activity and taken them completely out. So there's a range, definitely. They did gain access to some permit lock systems, and they had tried to lock them down, and there was a big, huge event around that. We chatted about that before, but... So... Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, there are some. They got special trade, too, that can do some serious stuff in the background as well. 
So there is a range, right? And they definitely use it at its full range. So modules, when you go through, when you're setting up your ship, you got hard points, your utilities, the core, optional, and then vehicle base. So hard points are just your weapons. Pretty straightforward. Every ship's got a different loadout. It's up to you what you enjoy, depending on what you like. Tangible weapons like multi-cannons, they have rounds that you have to replace. Lasers, which I almost never use, don't run out of rounds, but they definitely run out of power. So the ship has to be built a little differently and measured as far as allocation, and I'll get into that in just a second. Utility mounts on the flip side of that are all the things that buff components on your ship. Gives you some added benefit that the ship itself can't do without assistance. Ship has a maximum. These give you over the maximum in that instance. Allows you to give you something else. Some other thing to prevent something from happening or allow something to happen that the ship itself can't do on its own. Core internals are the ship itself. The physical nature of what operates. The hull, the power plant, thrusters, frame shift drive, all of that. It's not a matter of putting everything to A class. It goes up in grades, depending on what it is. Starts at E and goes up to A. Depending on the grade, they do different things. Each module allocation will give you that information. For me, what I like to do is pay attention to the durability of what it is. So I like to use certain combinations on certain ships. Every ship's a little different. I don't run A on every ship. There are ships that I have quite a Frankenstein combination of modules because it allows the ship to be able to fly a very specific way. I have set it up for the way that I enjoy flying that vessel. Every ship is a little different, so they're all different as far as their loadout. There are some ships that I do run all A-class. There are some ships that I run all D-class modules. It depends on what I'm using the ship for and what I'm doing. D is the lightest and the most efficient. As far as durational use, B is very durable. C has its measure, right? And A is at the boundaries of perfection, though they are very light in that instance. An A-class shield generator can get shut down faster than a B-class shield generator in certain instances, depending on how it's being shut down. When I'm doing exploration, I usually run B-class because it's more durable to physical trauma, not rounds of ammunition trauma, right? So it depends. You'll learn more of that the more that you play around with it. It's what you need, right? Your internal compartments, it doesn't matter what those compartments are. Any module can be slotted in and out of these modules here. Core modules, you're stuck to what you have. Whatever that class is, from E to A is all you have optionally. But in core, that's it. That's where it stops. Optional is a free-for-all. You can reallocate any of these out in any combination. You could put a shield here, I could put a shield down here, I could put it wherever. Your only measure when you're doing things is what is the range of my ship. So there are times in which the shield generator would be too small. It would not provide enough to extend beyond the actual scale of the ship. So if I put a class three shield generator on here, it's not gonna extend out to the outside of my whole ship. I'm gonna lose layers, and even in combat when I get hit, you'll see it doesn't actually cover the entire ship. So there'll be parts of my ship exposed beyond that shield layer. It's not that great. And that's how it should be, literally, it's underpowered. You can put the wrong size thruster on a ship, right? You could scale it down too far and make the ship too heavy, but the thruster doesn't even move it. So you got that measure as well that you got to pay attention to. So there's a bit of a risk in there, playing around with it. But on here, it's whatever you need. On here, I set this up full tanked out. I got a lot of hull reinforcement and module reinforcement because I was hitting the nav beacons, making sure that I was tanked out full. I have a single cargo rack on here. Four slot is the minimum. To be able to go out and do signal sources, nav beacon, all that stuff. Someone drops something, four is about the average of what you need. I did some hot combat. I have some cargo on my ship from that. I've got a couple cryopods still sitting on here from earlier that I got to drop off because they're setting in stasis right now. But signal sources will also drop items and you need a cargo rack to get. 
there are times when you're doing signal sources that you don't need a cargo rack, that your ship can scoop them up anyways. You've done it both ways. It's best to have at least four. Every ship has the capacity to carry at least four slots. At minimum, two. Doesn't matter if you're doing exploration in deep space, because you'll find things that you do need. So it's best to do that. At least four. But two, I mean, outside of civilized space, you could get away with it. I ran into an instance in which there was two canisters of deep space exploration. Both were worth one billion credits. So it's worth it, right? Yeah, I would disagree with you about dropping armor for shields and speed. I flew with no shields, and I flew with shields. I flew with full-on armor with shields, full-on full armor, no shields. doesn't matter. It's whatever you need as a pilot. doesn't matter you're good or you're bad because you have shields. You don't have shields. You're not a good pilot because you don't fly with shields off. Kiss my ass. It's all BS. That's not how it works. The game space itself has variances to it. There are times in which you can fly with shields and fly without shields. I can go into my modules and turn my shields on and off no matter what. I have a shield generator on, and if for some reason I need to turn my shields off for some reason in combat, maybe I'm running too hot, the shields are soaking too much thermal heat, I can just simply go into the module and turn them off. That capacity makes me a better pilot because I am using the full extent of my vessel. I'm not undermining the capacity of the technology available. Shields on, shields off, armor on, armor off. Every ship is built to whatever way you would require. It doesn't make you a better pilot or a lesser pilot unless you talk that somebody else is lesser or better than you because of whatever, right? They build the ship the way that they need to. It doesn't really make any difference. Who cares? You have a variety of choices and you go through and you can build it to those variety of choices. I like running biweave because I don't really care if my shields are on or they're off. Biweaves power down and power back on quickly. So if for some reason they drop, oh well, they drop. I don't have to worry about maintaining my pips to make them power back on. A biweave does it just fine. No problem. It was deep space exploration canister. They were both worth one billion. So I made two billion on two deep space exploration canisters. They had data on them, data logs. I scooped them up. I also had four blueprints that, for me, seemed like they were for the Death Star because they paid me a million a canister. So I made four million from four canisters. Four blueprints, so I made a mil on each one. So that's why I'm glad I had four cargo racks because each one took a cargo rack. So, But, again, all this allocation is whatever you want. For me, I take off Super Cruise Assist because I do not need it. I do not require it. I just get rid of it. Not a thing. Fuel scoop. It's all a measure on the thermal dynamics of the ship. So if you have it where you fly around and you find yourself doing multiple things like I usually do. Every ship has got a different thermal dynamics. It's loadout, it's shield. It's engine setup. It's going to have different thermals. That's going to be a variance. You can't say, well, you have to put this on or you have to put that on. You'll have to play around with what works. When you're scooping a star, a smaller fuel scoop will take longer to fill than a larger one, clearly. But a larger one also increases the heat and thermal of the ship. It may not be as efficient as a smaller one for you to do what you need. If you're doing a lot of deep space exploration, putting the biggest fuel scoop on there might not be beneficial. I left and I changed it. I put a different module grade of fuel scoop. I put an A instead of a D. It was a problem. I had to fly back and put the D back on. The D was much more efficient thermodynamic wise. I would never climb over 63. It stayed perfect. Every star, no matter what star, was 63. When I started scooping some of the larger, more higher output stars with the A class, it got a little spicy. It was taking damage. So, pretty serious. I might have a screenshot of the canisters, but not the payout on it, I don't think. It's in my pilot logs. I wrote it down. I got another one that's setting out there between Eagle Neb and um, Omega Neb. There's a canister there 
that I had went through, there was an instance that popped up. I wrote the system down. It's in the pilot log somewhere. There was a canister there, deep space exploration as well, and it was worth 7 million credits, one canister. Just sitting there floating in the middle of nowhere. It was a busted up ship in the middle of nowhere. Just happened to hop through the system between Omega Nab and Eagle Nab, and there was a canister set there. Yeah, yeah. If I wouldn't have had the cargo rack, and I almost always have a cargo rack on, I almost took it off when I made that flight. I would have missed it. So that's why I say, after that instance, do not fly without one at least in the two slot, because at least you have four. I haven't had it where I ran into something that I was like, man, I wish I had this cargo rack a little larger. Because when I ran with the two doing deep space, I was like, I'm going to find something else. Because if you find something out there, you've got no way to pick it up. Even if you find stuff, there are certain items for synthesis that you can't just grab. You can't just grab a thing. Without a cargo rack, it won't allow you to. So even if though you, though you open up the cargo hatch, it won't let you grab it. Now, there are some things that you can do, like if a ship drops parts in that. There are times in which you can grab up stuff, but Frontier got wise to it, and they went in and started doing some other stuff, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like I said, shields on, shields off. So depending on it, you do the thermodynamic testing for your ship. I've tested all the ships that I've ever flown. My ASP Explorer is the one I have the most testing with. My ASP Mark II... I have very high range. I cooked my Viper up well into the thousands without having a problem. She never popped because I did thermodynamic testing on it. I had the module set very precisely so I could cook it if I needed to because it cooks itself. Even shooting certain weapons, you'll cook yourself in certain ships. You'll run extra hot. But it'll hold. It will definitely do it. So you have to test the ship and find out. So you'll buy a ship, it's going to be expendable, and you will test it fully. You'll put each module on to grade and test them individually and find out. you learn more about how you can build a ship by doing that. So again, back to the fuel scoops. In E-Class, we'll get the job done. You can at least scoop and get fuel. It just takes longer, that's all. The same thing happens, and I'll hop out of this for a second and just explain something else. If I'm to jump a star system here, I'm setting inside orbit, I'm in here and I'm going to power up my FSD, which is why I say practice in those systems, like I said. When you jump from system to system, you've got several systems lined up, you're doing exploration, whatever. It doesn't matter if you fly the distance without going into super cruise or you hit the jump and use the FSD to its maximum and jump it within two minutes. The same fuel is consumed across the distance, whether it's like this or across the whatever range of time it takes you to fly it manually. There's a way to increase your flight speed across that range, hitting gravity wells and things like that. You could speed up the duration from here to here quite exponentially. You can also use synthesis on your ship to power your engines to make that happen as well. So jumping from here to here and flying from here to here uses the same fuel no matter what. It just uses fuel within seconds or fuel within however long it takes you to fly that. The distance is measured equally regardless. A lot of people don't pay attention to that, but it is a thing. And we hop back into our menu where we are. So back to our, our outfitting. Inside the optionals, when you load them out, like I said, I do not use the Super Cruise Assist at all. You can, if you're flying with that, and I do not use automated docking, but you can. Especially if you do a lot of flying around and you're not used to docking, because you've been out flying and landing for a bit. You're going to be rusty when you come back, so you could put it on, keep yourself from running into problems. There are some starports, player-owned, that get grouchy. They're very low on their measure of crime and punishment. So what happens is... You squeak one tiny thruster wrong, and you're going to get a fine. So avoiding that in a system you don't know, you could keep that module on, but it's not required. You can take it off. Once you're comfortable with flying and that's what you're doing, you can just leave it off. It doesn't have to be on there. But because someone has it on there, it doesn't make them lesser. I put it on because I've been out in deep space flying around forever. When I come back, awful rusty. Plus I'm tired because it might be 15 hours. It might be sitting in the game playing. So it depends. 
if that's the case and you're going to be doing it for a duration of time, it's up to you. Super Cruise Assist will also let you reach orbital around a planet to keep you from running into the planet as well. So if you approach it, it keeps you from getting into trouble. Uh, my pilot logs are tangible. They're literally like this. I don't put them somewhere else because I might find something I don't want some other player going in there and exploit, right? But we do cover it a lot on stream. There's a lot of times that I do the stuff. And if I do find something good, what I'll do is I'll put it on the channel. I'll put it in the community tab so somebody else can find it. Got a lot of systems I scan that are worth like 7 mil, the system itself. I had some that are worth even higher than that, 10 mil for a system. Quite sizable. The system was worth a chunk. Scanning it fully, doing the codexes, it's worth a lot. So I make notes of ones like that. Anything over 2 mil for a system I jump into, I make a note of it. If there's something that I found in a thing, I make a note of it in the pilot logs. But what you can do is you can go over to the Patreon page. I have the pilot logs there that you can get that are blank, and you can use some for yourself if you would like. But I don't share all the information from my pilot logs. Those are mine. Those are my personal space. But I do share some of it. I do put it on the channel so that it's there. And if I have a live stream, obviously, it's right there on the screen. So there are a lot of videos on there. We played it right from the Sidewinder on out. It's all there. So you can see all that stuff. Pretty sure when I did uh, those early ones, one of those might have been the ones in which I passed through that system and picked those up and scanned that. Between, I, between the ones from Eagle to Omega Nab, there was a instance in which I scanned a repeat of that same canister that popped up on. So you'd be able to see that on that particular video. But back into it, uh, our vehicle bays. You have to equip the ship with a vehicle bay, a hangar bay for them, to be able to put a vehicle on the ship. It's kind of dumb how it is, because when you go into the menus here to do what you need to do, it doesn't let you do that as efficiently as it could. It's a little bit off, but that's all right. So when you do get it, you come to the restock vehicle screen over here in the advanced maintenance, and you can get yourself a vehicle once it's there. If you lose it, there'll be a slot empty and you can equip it with whichever one's available. Same thing with ship launch fighters. If I had one, once you buy them, you come here and get that taken care of. The same thing happens with limpets. When you buy a limpet controller, you don't automatically have limpets. You can use synthesis to create four limpets, but that's just four. That's just one round of the basics. You usually need more than that to be able to accomplish more durational stuff, so you come here and buy them. You can buy and sell them. If you move between one ship and another, what cargo you have limpet-wise moves between one ship and another. So what you want to do is make sure that you take and sell those back if you don't need them. If I have limpets, I could get rid of them. So I can say, goodbye limpets, right? Confirm. The limpets are gone. They get rid of them. I gotta hop out of that menu and go back in because this menu doesn't like to cooperate. I just hit cancel, but they're gone. Anyways, besides that, going into the advanced maintenance screen, you want to do that every time that you're docking. Because there's damage and stuff that happens to your ship that's not tracked in the main repair docking sequence of repairs. So you have to come over here and do your structural repairs here. Paint, things like that is all in this location. Simply just jumping around out there does damage to your ship. So your ship's not at 100%, even though you think it's 100%. Even though on the main screen out there in Starport, and you say make repairs on your three options... It's not 100% unless you come over here to the screen to actually repair the rest of this hull, or pest of this ship. Cockpit could have damage, the ship integrity could be lower, the hull could have damage that's not covered, paint could be peeling off. I flew to the paint was zero. You almost could not recognize the ship. And that's another little tidbit, I have it in my notes, but it brings up that point. If they can't identify your ship visually, they will scan your ship or possibly detain it or deny access to docking, especially if they're looking for a ship. There's been a ship in the area that's caused problems, and your ship happens to be that same type with maybe the same color. 
They may not allow you to dock, and system security may come and interdict your ship, or they may come and misidentify your ship, impound it perhaps until they identify it properly, which could send you a ways away. Once they realize it's you, obviously, then they would reverse that and not pay, have you pay for the impound fee. But they will definitely take the ship and do stuff. I've had it happen. Does it. Full range. So they have to be able to read the identifications for the vessel. So when it starts wearing off, I've got a ship out there in deep space right now that's awful non-identifiable. The paint's peeling quite substantially. It goes down based off of what you're doing with it. A lot of hot combat will cause some serious damage. I've had some major laser blasts that peel my ship to pieces. I could have the glass blown completely out and be flying around doing combat and stuff. When I come back, it's damaged, clearly. Got to do some stuff. You can use synthesis to a point, but once the glass is gone, you can't make repairs out there in the wilds, we'll say. Because you can use an auto field maintenance unit module on your vessel to do band-aid work while you're out and about not at a starport. It's not 100%. It just covers the basics. It'll keep the ship intact enough to keep life support system uncompromised as long as the glass isn't blown. Frontier didn't give us the option to be able to fix the glass out there in the wilds yet. We don't have a limpet for that, but I wish we did. So, you know, it's a new thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I covered that, too. Sidewinder really is the best. I stayed in the Sidewinder for a whole year. I said, what if we never left this ship? I did that with every ship. I played a ship. And I didn't get out of it. I said, I'm in this ship, I'm going to fly this ship, and I'm not going to leave this vessel. This will be the vessel. I will fly this, and that's it. Period. Yeah, exactly. You can use synthesis. You can also, there's an alternative, which I covered that on stream before, too. If the glass blows out, don't panic. There's a lot of options for you in the game that you can use. So if your glass blows out, no problem. You may have synthesis to be able to restore another time frame because it has a countdown to it you can use synthesis to restore oxygen alternatively you cannot have synthesis which i've done and fly to an oxygen rich planet and dip your ship inside that atmosphere and restock to full maximum your oxygen on your vessel glass is blown you stick your head out the window and suck in that fresh air on that oxygen rich planet that's why I take the time when I'm in a system before I'm going to be doing some spicy stuff where my ship could cause damage, right? Get the HUD blown out. Where is that here? Where do I need to go to make that happen? You can jump in Super Cruise with the HUD blown out. You have a Remlock suit anyways, so it doesn't matter if the glass is blown, but you're flying blind. All your reticles are gone. A lot of times you can't identify your stuff, but... Brings up a good point, which we've covered before on stream, because I've had the glass blown out many times. Doesn't bother me. I don't care. I've had my ship down to 3% and still came back. I haven't lost a ship yet. So you can, when the glass is blown out, because it typically focuses on the front of the vessel, you can use your ship fully. Because every piece of this glass, and this is a problem in the game that I wish they would correct, because it doesn't work like this in real life. In real life, what happens is the actual visor mechanism displays that information. Should, for some reason, the glass blow out, it transfers that to the onboard directly on your person. We have a Remlock suit. What should happen is the HUD should transfer over to our suit. We know when we're out of our ship in Odyssey, it transfers that information to our glass inside of our helmet so we can see. I wish it did that here, but it doesn't. When we're in the ship, it does not transfer that to that. The glass is blown, you're penalized. Maximum level. No problem. You can rotate your head and look around. There is glass that's intact somewhere. You can rotate your ship, fly off to the side a little bit of your target, Rotate your head over and look out the glass and you'll be able to see where your target is. Lock the target from here because you can lock the target from the side of your window without a problem. You're aiming at it, you can lock it from here, no problem. You can then rotate your ship and fly blind towards that for a duration of time. Pause, fly casual. 
rotate back, take a look. How close am I to that target now? Am I getting closer? Perfect. So you can fly blind, so to speak, until you get close. But there's no extra visuals here. You lose a lot. Definitely changes how this works when the glass is gone. Can look above. There's a lot of glass. Some ships have more glass than others. Some ships have less glass than others, right? Very minuscule amount. When that blows out, there really isn't a little piece in a corner, because that's what I had. I had a tiny piece in the corner that gave me enough and had to fly back with it like that. I also had it where I was out of synthesis and I knew I had a 45 minute flight and I only had seven minutes of oxygen. But I didn't panic. I knew where the oxygen-rich planet was, and I had some synthesis. So I used the synthesis very sparingly down to the last second. And it takes a minute, so allow enough time for the synthesis to work. And I'll show you where synthesis is. When you go to your inventory screen, we've covered this a lot. You can scroll through all your menus, there's a lot of menus here, but we're not going to cover all those today. We're just going to cover the basics. So you can come over here, and you can come down to synthesis. There's tons of stuff in here you can use. What you'd be looking for when the glass blows out all the way down all the way down to life support you simply need iron and nickel to make that happen right now i currently have at minuscule 18 potentially so i usually do half i'll say i have nine without question recharges on my life support system hit the button takes a moment it recharges up, my oxygen resets itself back to the maximum amount of whatever my module is set to. Now that being said, we're going to go back to our modules for a second. And I will show you the life support system. And then we're going to end it at that point. We've covered all the basics. So on your core internals, your life support system is here. Depending on the life support system grade is the duration of time that you receive. It also measures on scale. So in this instance, I have a 5A, so I have 25 minutes of life support system. It's almost a half an hour. I can fly around with the glass blown up. I am not worried. It doesn't take a half an hour to get between systems or dock or whatever, right? Now, there was a time in which I was extra close, where I was really cutting it in. I barely got into the docking sequence. There was a bunch of ships causing delays in the docking sequence. And trust me, dumb stuff will happen, especially when dumb things happen. It gets compounding, the butterfly effect. Stellar Forge knows the measure of success and fail. It's going to put pressure on you. It will definitely do that. We consider it nerfing because it is well aware of your current predicament. So it will have a ship hang up, and all of a sudden there's ships in the way, and oh, Commander, you need to wait at the docking sequence, such and such. Oh, you can't dock right now, there's not an open landing pad. All this stuff will occur, so don't wait till the last second to make decisions. Give yourself enough time. Practice with it, don't panic. But you can adjust it, right? It goes from two minutes... Very lowest, I think it is. Very lowest. I've had them seven minutes. Depends on what the ship is. And then go all the way up. All the way to the top. Yeah. And we've done that on stream quite often. Flight assist off and flight assist on is quite measurable. So, in closure, I'm debarking this starport for a moment. Now, we've done this quite often, and I've showed how this works. It's quite a range to this. I don't fly with flight control off completely for any extended period of time. It doesn't make you a better pilot, it makes you an idiot. Flying with it off completely because you are not using the ship to its full capacity. I'll explain that in a second on how that works. So when you fly, you exit, we're leaving the station, no problem. I'm outside. Don't care about anything else, we're leaving. Bye bye. So out here, fly our ship and do our thing, right? There are some commanders that say, turn flight control off and never turn it on. You need to only fly with flight control off. Well, genius, you're not flying at 100% of your ship. You'll always be less flying with flight control off because it doesn't give your engines 100% capacity. You are at less. No matter what engineering you try to pull, you will be at less. When you turn flight control off, 
you are not using your primary engines. You are using secondary engines. So we can see our vessel here. We've got our thrusters, right? Very direct. We also have other thrusters on our ship that maintain it. These lateral thrusters here that are on here. Allow our ship to levitate even in systems that have no gravity. Our ships don't have lift. They're not airplanes, right? Vertical takeoff is the thing. So these ships require these to be able to fly around properly. When you turn flight control off, power is measured very precisely to the rest of these thrusters. So you are not at maximum capacity. But, that being said, when you are boosting and flying around, and every ship is different, depends on what you're flying. Python's got a real fat ass on it. If you're trying to do maneuvers with it, she's going to swing around like you're trying to drift a semi truck It's not that great. Whereas ships like the Sidewinder can really turn, so you can do some serious stuff. This ship, it's got a pretty decent setup, right? We're at all four corners. This ship actually flies like my car drives. I can pull some moves in here like I can in my car. I've got an all-wheel drive. I can do some stuff like I can in this ship. It's like I got all-wheel drive on here, so it's pretty nice. This is the Crusader. Chieftain, on the other hand, sucks. In comparison, the ship is far superior, in my opinion. So we fly, and we want to fly with flight control off, let's say. So what does flight control off do? My ship is now, and I will pop out, and I will measure around this, let you see. Flight control off is doing all kinds of stuff here, right? This is flight control off. I've done nothing. I've simply turned flight control off and left my ship in motion. You can see what thrusters are moving, what thrusters are doing their thing. That's flight control off. It's not being stabilized. The moment I kick flight control back on, you can see my ship is restabilized automatically. It has been leveled. A combat pilot in our current age, in the real world, has the option to do the same feature on their vessel to pull some serious maneuvers, right? Blue Angels, they use this very much so. They will punch flight control off and tip and dive and twist that ship in all kinds of directions. There is a safety measure to that on how you can and can't do that. You can rip a ship to pieces, you can cause more damage to the ship, make it more vulnerable and do some serious things that aren't beneficial to you with flight control off that flight control on measures more effectively. Now that being said, when we're flying around, right, doing our thing, if I want to turn and I flew flight control off, right, here we are, we're aiming at this planet. If I want to fly towards it, all of a sudden turn around, turning flight control off and switching it back on, you can see I can make this happen quite rapidly. If I do this and I just fly normally and do it, Right? I'm doing nothing else, I'm flying normally and not flight control off. I'm still going. There's quite a difference there in the capacity of the ship's maneuverability to make this happen. Quite a range to that. Your ship's different, they weigh different amounts. You can really maneuver a ship around quite effectively. If I turn flight control off, right, flight assist has been turned off, I can hold it manually or not. That's why I went through the features on how we set it up. If you keep your ship very organized in here on how you do this, you can do all kinds of stuff. Okay? I am controlling my ship. If I want to barrel roll this, I can make my ship turn into that barrel roll much faster, turning it off and turning it back on. I can make that happen. I'm, I literally did a 360 degree and I'm flying back over my, my path. I'll do it again. I have green thrusters, you can't miss them. I'm back on my flight path and coming back around. I use boost and flight control together to make maneuvers happen for my ship that it can't do without. It needs a little bit more and flight control will restrict it from making that happen. Now, if we adjust our pips and do the same thing, annually restrict the capacity of our vessel. Do this. Hit boost and hit flight control off. Right? I'm doing my maneuver. You can see that it doesn't make any bit of difference making that change. But 
Notice I am in reverse. I'm not going forward. Now I'm going forward. It has a measure to it. That's just 50% allocation. That's all I did. Between the power to the engines at max and not. So using flight control on and off will definitely change the way your ship can fly. You have to practice on how that works. You're not going to be able to do that instantaneous. Every ship's a little different. So when you do it, you'll have to time it. It's all about timing with this. And get comfortable with moving it. Asteroid fields are an excellent place to practice on how your ship moves. You're going to build every ship different. Someone's saying, well, I got mine and I do this and that and that, blah, blah, blah. No. If their ship has heavier weight, that maneuver may not be effective for them. They may have to do something else. They may have to do it earlier. It's kind of like in the real world when you have slip and grip and you're talking about a car. Flight control on and off is very much that. In this game, the ships are built on top of the game's parameters, not within the game's parameters. So they move along it as if there was tires and traction as a factor. This is kind of a good reference to that so you can get a visual. If you're driving your car and you've ever hit slippery road conditions, it's very similar to what happens when you're hitting flight control on and off. There is some slide happening there, not full-on control of happening there. You have to work the pips, and you have to work the thrusters very much directly to make it maintain control. You can keep it off completely and fly around all over the place, but you are lesser as far as the ship's capacity. It will use the other thrusters and put power to them more than your main ones. 90% at max you'll have to your main thrusters. I have 100% to mine, because I do not remain in flight control off. I simply use it to turn the ship, and by doing so, I prevent it from doing things that I do not want. When I turn it and turn it off, and hit boost to turn it on, I prevent my ship from stopping me. As you can see, I'm not sliding backwards. I stop and can go back in the direction I came immediately. There is no delay with it. If I reduce the power in the pips, then I will slide. This is a heavy ship. I'm tanked out. I've got over 3,000 hull. If I was in another ship, I have to do other things to make it happen. So flight control on and flight control off is going to operate differently Depending on how you load the vessel, a very light ship may not even need to use flight control to switch the ship around quicker than the oppositional ship. You may be able to do it without it. There are times in which flight control off may need to be required because you flying, it may be trying to prevent you from crashing into something and moving to it, and you simply say, no, I am in control of my vessel. I do what the maneuvers are. I want the ship to do all kinds of twisting and moving. But me, I get motion sickness very easily. So flight control could be a massive problem. It's not stable. You're using all of the thrusters on the ship at the same time, not the forward thrusters. The lateral thrusters, the thrusters that move the ship sideways, when I hit boost, I don't have my forward thrusters going. I'm using the ones that are on the side of the ship to move left and right, and you can see it's not really doing a whole lot. It's really losing the capacity to move. But if I boost and then use the thrusters, you can see that it starts to rotate the ship. It does so without any issue. If I do so the other direction and I hit boost, it does so very easily. I simply casually move the mouse and I'm having zero problem. I have worked so many times on stream where I can sideboard pirate mentality and just work a loop around a target using flight control on and having zero problem by simply using the lateral thrusters of which they are not being reduced. Flight control reduces the thrusters capacity at maximum. So realize what it is doing. It is distributing power across all of the thrusters in that instance. There's no 
measure of directly these thrusters. You have to do that yourself. So you have to learn in how your ship is moving, what thrusters do I need to move because I'm not getting assistance in that matter. The COVAS has been disactivated, deactivated. You are doing it. So if I fly this and I hit boost and I turn my ship, Kovas is on. It's rotated me around effectively. If I do that same maneuver and I turn flight control off and, and do it, you can see I'm not getting the same rotation. Literally did the same maneuver. I fly with it on and I hit the rotation, I'm getting rotation. I fly with the boost and I hit flight control off, I don't get the rotation. There's no way to do it at the same time. You have to use the other thrusters to make that happen at which point I can get it to rotate with the flight assist off. It's more stuff to have to press, more things to have to do. Now, that's keyboard and mouse. On a joystick, flight assist on and off changes dramatically because you can do things with flight assist off that you're not quite capable of doing on a mouse and keyboard. It takes practice. You're not going to be Billy or Susie at maximum capacity flying with flight assist off all the time saying that everybody's less if they don't. If you don't fly with shields off, you're not a combat pilot. They can all suck it. Because it's all hot BS. It matters not. You could load the ship out equally the same and say, well, here, here's my ship and do it. And the moves they're pulling in their vessel, in your ship, loaded the way you have it, they're going to have a problem. Clearly. You've loaded your ship out differently than theirs. The only way that they're going to be as equally effective and doing what they're doing is if they fly in exactly the same loaded out ship exactly the way they have it. They have practice. It takes time. So it doesn't matter how you load your ship. You can use it to whatever advantage you would like. I, myself, only simply use flight control to maneuver my ship around in an instance in which I'm doing combat with preventing my ship from flying backwards. I did it very slow. I didn't do it fast. My ship did not fly in reverse. If I do it any different, this ship will automatically go in reverse. My thrusters will do what I had set up previously in the menu options for it not to go in reverse with thrusters. But if I turn it off and I fly it different, it will make me go in reverse. I will do that maneuver, fly it directly, turn my ship around, keeping my forward momentum going, hit boost, and I will be going backwards if I do not do it. I don't want my ship flying with thrusters in reverse because then I have to take all that extra time to get them to go from reverse to fly forward. And in combat situations, seconds could be the difference between success and fail. You could not be on target in that instance. The rest of the time, flight, flight assist on and off, flight control on, flight, flight control off, doesn't make any difference. I can fly down here to an asteroid field, get one that's nice and loose with asteroids, not a bunch, put your power all the way to the system so you only have two into engines and practice. Those orbital bodies, find yourself a nice asteroid that doesn't move around, fly towards it, casually, your engines are at half, without boost, and practice with the vessel that you have, on and off, so you can see what happens. What does it feel like? There are locations that have higher gravity that it also affects. It's another factor. It's not a matter of just turning it on and off. You have to weigh the rest of the game. Gravity also measures to that. So flight assist off in a high gravity situation you are on your own. The Kovas is not trying to keep you level anymore. So if you mess up on your ducking and weaving, you're going to hit the deck. It's going to be messy. We were doing that on a stream the other day. I was hitting the deck. I turned it off to manage those maneuvers that close. Because the Kovas would have prevented me from flying at that altitude or that space at that speed. It would have said, impact and it would have tried to prevent me from hitting that object. That's the reason why you would disengage the Kovas' safety protocols, because that's what it is. Turn off its measure. 
you are now in full control of what is happening to the ship with practice, right? It's make you any better or any less. There are times in which you never have to turn it off. There are times in which you may wish to turn it off. All depends on what you would like to do. I've had commanders never ever turn flight assists off. They keep it on all the time. And in the way that they have their ship up, they can make no problem. Things happen to the way they fly their ship. They have the option to build it however they would like. Just as you do and I do, whatever works, works. Doesn't make anyone less or more. Flying with it off completely all the time, saying that it's the best, is a lie. Because it is, it is less automatic. Because that's what flight assist does. It redistributes the ship's allocations to lesser value. You will not get the maximum. It will not allow you to do that. You won't be able to reach the same speeds. You won't be able to do the same in operational. It changes that as it turns the Kovas on. Kovas is tied directly to the game's mechanics. So you have to measure them. It's whatever works. Whatever you need. There's been times that I flew with it off for quite a duration. There's been times when I never turn it off, depending on where it is, right? All kinds of things. So that being said, I'm going to do one system hop, give you an example. Hop over to the map. I have a system that I need to go to. I need to go back over here to Weird, so that's where I'm going. So we're here. We're in Super Cruise. We're flying around. We're doing our thing, right? We're in here. That's why I say practice. You can dial this all the way down to the bottom. I'm at the bottom, but I'm in super cruise. At flat lines here. This is as low as it will go. From here, I can enter into all the rest of the options. I can do a spectral analysis here. We went into that millions of times. It's been covered so much. We've got eight months of straight exploration on the other. So I won't go into it. Most everything happens here. You are moving at this rate continuously. There are times in which you can accelerate beyond your capacity. I have this maxed out to here. You can see where the bar is. I've got full to engines. I'm flying. I'm heading to weird system. You can see that the number is increasing on my reticle. It goes up. It's happening. I'm at 9, 10, 11, 12, it's climbing up. I can hit gravity wells and fly through different locations in here to increase this. It will be almost as if I hit this jump, but I do not. I can reach speeds of almost full-on system jump in Super Cruise. There is a way to do that, but I got a lot of flight experience and exploration across the game and every combination of ships with loadouts that you would just be amazed. So, to make any difference, from here to there, it uses the same amount of fuel. You can see the bar. The blue is how much fuel it's going to use between here and there. If I fly this, it's just going to take time. That much fuel is going to be used regardless. Or, I can jump to this location. Jumping to it will use the same amount of fuel, it just takes less, which we talked about. When I jump into a system before I go, typically I turn my fuel scoop off until I make sure it's safe. But I know where I'm going, so I'm not going to bother with that, but I'll go over it when I get there. Show how you can do that. For some instance, I was expecting there to be a lot of heat or something like that. I could also turn my shields off if I wanted to. Prevent heat, because shields will get soaked with heat. There's a way to make that happen. So you got to watch that. So when I enter in, I have no boundaries set here. I'm inside fuel scoop range. Like I said, you can turn these on and off. So I'll move forward a little bit. You can see the exclusion zone now. This is the exclusion zone of this star. I want to keep that exclusion zone just at the edge of my ship. The closer I fly to it, the more the heat on my ship happens. The farther away, the less the heat. The same thing happens with how much fuel. There are some stars that pump out a lot. Fuel scoop measures to this. And there are some that do not. 
in this instance, most of the jumps where I'm at, I don't need a bigger fuel scoop because I have a very minuscule tank variance here. It's quite a sizable tank. I normally fly with my tanks at half. I take the tank on every ship and I cut it in half. You can see temperature is spicy, awful hot closer I fly, right? So usually when I'm flying in a ship, I don't even fly with the tank at the maximum scale. And my core components, I reduce the tank to half, especially if I'm doing combat. If I'm doing local combat, I may cut it down to a quarter because it's a lot of mass and it takes out a lot of that extra weight, which makes the ship handle better, makes it faster, makes it easily maneuverable. You could actually increase the maneuverability of a ship by changing the fuel tank down properly. Fuel scoop on or off doesn't matter. If I'm doing local stuff, typically I won't have a fuel scoop on, so I got another module, right? I can put something else in there. If I take the fuel tank and reduce it down, I've decreased the mass. Maybe I can put another module on that makes it heavier. Maybe I got something that's heavier. Most of my ships I'm running at half mass, meaning that if I was to load it out any different, it would be larger than that, quite substantially so. So I load my ships out so that the maximum weight of my vessel, I'm at half of that, which allows my thrusters to operate unengineered, because I've only done engineering in the last month. I played the game since it has come out. I've never done engineering versus the first 30 days when it first arrived. It was a waste. I didn't like it. I didn't like the balance of it. So I didn't use it. Didn't do what it said. I don't use engineering. I can still take out an engineering ship. No problem. That being said, you can skip all of that extra space in there and really streamline it. They say, oh, you have to use this ship for exploration. No. You can make another ship do it. You gotta make some adjustments. I could do exploration in this ship, probably get 30 light years. I could cut this fuel tank down quite considerably, reallocate where that fuel scoop is, and I can make it happen. I know how much I use. That was 10 light years I jumped. If I needed to jump 20 light years or 30 light years, depending on what my FSD's loadout is, I know how much that uses on the fuel bar. I can dial that in. I don't make a single jump and empty my tank. It's going to be a couple of jumps, so I'll have time in there to be able to get fuel. If I figure at least every other star I'm jumping to has got fuel, I can dial my fuel tank accordingly to that. Reduces mass. Now my fuel... And my jump range all of a sudden has been increased. My jump range maybe goes from 25 to 28. Now, maybe it goes from 22 to 30. Depending on the scale of the fuel tank, there are some ships with some sizable fuel tanks and not that great a jump range. But you reduce that fuel tank down, you got one heck of a jump range increase, right? I've got an ASP, unengineered, can jump 30 light years. No problem. The Betty. We're in deep space exploration right now. She's stripped down. I'm not running with band-aids or trading wheels on there. I got no auto field maintenance. You know, I don't have the typical stuff an explorer would use. I've got two guns. I've got a fuel scoop, and I've got a fuel tank at half. I've got the core components on my ship that I have to have. But all those other slots and the alternatives are empty. There's nothing. It's completely vacant. Besides the cargo rack, right? In case I find some. That's it. She's empty. Gutted the ship. Don't need anything on there. I'm doing exploration. What do I need anything else for? I've got guns in case I run into Thargoids or some other stupid ship that happens to be out there. Pirates, maybe. Never know. And that's it. Nothing. I also left the starter location and flew thousands and thousands of light years in my gunship. Without problem. Fully tanked out, full armor. I put a fuel scoop on it. That's all I did. I took out one class one slot, just like I did on here, and put a fuel scoop. Just a fuel scoop. I don't care if it takes me two minutes to scoop fuel. I'm still out there doing my thing. So what? While it's scooping fuel, you know what I do? I hop in here and I scan the system. While Jefferson's pumping gas, I've got it measured exactly correctly for how fast I can go through here and scan an entire system. Whole system. From hanging it... Jefferson's pumping gas. I don't care. Jefferson's doing it. I don't have to sit there and literally hold the thing. So while he's doing that, I'm in here. Well, I'm going to scan it. What do I got? Got a signal source here. What do I got over here? Got a signal source here. Jefferson's pumping gas. I don't care if it's a class one. 
Everyone, oh, you gotta have a class five. It's got slack. Gotta be A class. No, shut your mouth. I gotta do all this other stuff here. This takes time. By the time I'm done, this might take me three or four minutes. My little dinky fuel scoop did just fine. I'm not hot. I don't have to worry about my ship overheating. It's all fine. It's a little tiny fuel scoop. I'm sat in there perfect, casual. My ship's just hovering. No problems. Something happens, the Kovacs will notify me here. Ship too hot. I can hear it. I got my ears open. Under attack. Jefferson will let me know. I hear it. I can get right back out of this. Under attack? Who could it be? Ship too hot? Oh, let me pull away from the star. Zero problems. So it doesn't make any difference. That's all BS, what they have to say about that. A fuel scoop and no fuel scoop is the only conversation. Beyond that is dialed in. Thermodynamics, what can your ship handle and what can't? How long do you have? Duration-wise, what do you need? There's going to be a difference to that. Every ship's going to be different because every pilot is going to need a different requirement. They're going to be loaded out different unless they're all flying the same cookie cutter. If that was the case and we didn't have options in here, then I would say yes. That fuel scoop matters. But we all have so many different possible combinations and ships and missions of our own to do that doing it one way isn't going to work. A fuel scoop on and a fuel scoop not on is the only measure. Alternatively, you run out of fuel. There is a faction in the game that will come and bring you fuel, which we talked about before. We talked about other entities. Fuel rats will come and give you gas. They may laugh. I was literally... A single light second away from the star. That's how close I got. But I had a gravity disruption that prevented me from reaching it. I couldn't get there. So I had to call the fuel rats. And I told them, I said, when you get here, you're going to laugh. I am so close, I can smell it. I said, I can cook hot dogs on this star from here. No problem. I said, but I can't throw the hose out from the fuel scoop that far. They got a chuckle. They came. When they arrived and they seen it, I said, you'll be able to fill your tank up because the star's right there. And they're like, wow, that sucks. I said, I was so close. I said, but I hit a gravity disruption and it slowed me down that tiny little bit. I said, really, you could just push me. So they laughed. They didn't even bother giving the limpets out. They went behind my ship and pushed me that tiny light second. And I said, well, there's the fuel scoop kicking on. <laughs> They're like, frick. And I said, yeah. I said, I'm sorry. I said, really, I didn't want to toast it. I said, I've been out here for four months. I said, I was tired and I looked at it and I had it. it looked like I had just enough slivers because there's measure. You can see on my fuel right now, there are actually two bars to the depletion of your fuel. One very much so on the top of the bar of fuel you can see is yellow. There's one right on the top, it's very thin. That bar right there, up at the top, is very precise. It is a single unit of fuel that is on your ship. That bar depletes down a single unit. So if your ship has 16, it will deplete that bar 16 times. It's that simple. Your HUD blowing out, your glass, there is also another faction that will come and do that. The whole seals, we talked about this before, is a faction that will show up and they will repair your hull for you in an emergency situation. I had one, so what I did is I docked on an oxygen-rich planet, clearly, and I said, I'm safe and sound, no stress on it. Whenever you guys are in the area, I blew the glass out. It wasn't my fault. I ran into Thargoids and I tapped a planet. I tapped the Thargoids into the planet, too. But I blew the glass out. So they came, no problem repaired the glass, and I said, you can take the Thargoids and use all that if you would like, but I don't put Thargoid stuff on my ship. So they did, clearly. It's a hell of a payout. They said, we'll take that as payout. <laughs> Those are worth quite a lot right now. <laughs> well, I said, it's all you. Scoop it up. So they did. Grabbed up all the goodies. They dropped a lot. Some sizable Thargoids that I knew I didn't have enough gun for. So I drove them into the planet. Because I knew I could survive it. All power to shields. <laughs> but the Thargoids didn't. They were in hot pursuit and they didn't realize. Entry was quite spicy. But, again, you don't panic. No problems. Piece of cake. 
easy. Now, I'm in the system. In the game itself, this will be the last thing, and then I'm going to hop off. Covered a lot. All of these locations inside here has had quite a lot of changes over the years. I'm sure there's going to be more. So this will be dated at some point. Most of the ones you'll find on there right now are about five years old. So hence the reason we're in here. Odyssey's had some updates on some stuff. So we might as well cover it. Anything with a blue is a landable planet. Anything with a blue with some little towers, looks like a little skyscraper city, has some structuring on the surface somewhere. Something of interest. No blue? Can't land. Doesn't mean you can't go and explore it. You just can't land on the surface. Most of the time it's gas giants, but there are times in which it's an actual planet. It might be too hot. It might have too high of gravity. There's things like that. There are times in which Frontier locks a planet down accessibility-wise because it has a glitch. When it was constructed in Stellar Forge, the planet itself is permit locked, but it doesn't have a permit that you can get. There are some planets that also have permits that will unlock based off of your activity inside of a location. So if for some reason this planet was locked, there may be missions at this starport here that I could do to unlock access to that planet. Food for thought. There's times in which there is a system near a location that is locked that will give you the permit for what? Again, food for thought. So my interest is going here. I need to go to Vonnerberg. So if they changed a few things in this menu, double clicking, right, will move it. Sometimes you got to click three times, whatever. Change it around. Holding it will lock it, and holding it will unlock it, right? The triangle means it's locked. No triangle, not locked. All of these different icons that pop up, they change those as well. So there's a range to them. The ones that I'm more concerned with consistency-wise is the rings. Blue, yes, land, blue, with the little structures on there, yes, we're good. Atmospheric planets, great. No atmospheric planets, just a ring, right? Atmosphere, yes, no atmosphere, still landable. So you know, Odyssey, you can get in and out of the ship. If it's got atmosphere, when I get out, my suit's not going to be depleting in the same fashion as if I get out on this planet. So that's a bit of it. Space lakes, they call it. I don't use space lakes, it's kind of broken. But if for some instance I was, that would be important to me. I may also need to know that it has atmosphere because my glass blow out, right? Maybe I need some oxygen and I need to get inside there and get some. It may have that. Being the case of using that map to get information. I'm gonna casually coast this and cover the last little tidbit. So in here, I hate Odyssey's menus. I prefer legacies because it gives me information that I require more in detail. On here, I got to go through 50 screens to get it, and I don't like it. But let's say I wanted to go to this planet here. Pops up this information here. It may tell me what I require here enough. But there's information that I also need. I'm missing the rest. I don't have that detail here right here, and I want it right here. I got to click some stuff to get it. I would like to know further information about this. I need to know, does, does this have an atmosphere on it? that has oxygen rich. Looking, don't see that here, doesn't have it. If I go to this planet here and I mark this one, let's say, get this one to pop up on the menu, I'll look at this one. Atmospheres, is it oxygen rich? I don't know, it doesn't tell me. On the other map, in Legacy, it would tell me would say that automatically here. I gotta do some other stuff. I'm not gonna get into it. These menus reveal that eventually. I just don't like it. So there's no point in me messing around with it. They're going to be changing it, I know, because it's not that great. It's a logistical nightmare. In Legacy, though, it gives you that information. It would tell me that immediately. I need to know it faster because of emergency situations. Odyssey doesn't give it to me quick enough. It is there, just not efficient. So, I head over here to this location. I've got to dock at Vonnerberg. I'm working on a little project, so I'll let this coast. I'll check out chat, see how things are going over here.
Yeah, yeah. And you can bring a heat sink if you like to keep your, your stuff. But I do thermodynamic testing and I've covered thousands. Th I flew all across the whole galaxy. There's, there isn't a location in a sector I haven't taken a ship to. The fuel scoop on and off is more important than a heat sink in my opinion. Heat sink, if you get into a pinch, you can simply go into the modules and turn the modules on and off. For me, what I do is if I don't know the area before I clear it, fuel scoop off. That is the number one reason why your ship has a thermal problem instantaneous, is because your fuel scoop is on. I have watched many commanders flying around doing exploration and they fly with the fuel scoop on. That is very risky to do that. That's where your heat problem comes in. Hence the reason to carry a limpet for a heat sink. Repair, because you've got damage. Not great. It's all extra weight. If I'm doing speed run, the less weight my ship is, the less time it takes for that to power up, to jump me to the next one. I may want to cover more ground quickly. And having all that extra modules in there required band-aids, right? Training wheels, because that's what that is. Band-aids are training wheels. It's extra stuff on the ship. The hull, the thrusters, the power plant, those are the basics. The moment you start adding other things to your utility slots besides a shield booster, for some instance, like heat sinks and everything else, those are because there's problems going to be happening by the way that you're flying. If you notice that happening too often, it's because of the way you're flying. You have to fly differently to prevent that. I eliminated having to take any of those modules doing exploration. It's not a requirement. I do not need an auto field maintenance unit to fly around doing exploration. I do not need heat sinks to fly around doing exploration. I set the ship up and do the testing before I go so that I know. What can my ship do? What can it handle? I need to know this ship like the back of my hand. Yes, instances can occur. Number one problem is because the fuel scoop is on. Normal. It is what creates that thermal barrier. You can also go in, in the instance of you running high heat for some reason, it may not be because of actual heat, maybe because of radiation problem. Shields on and shields off, literally, will prevent that from happening, eliminating the need for the heat sink, bypass having to carry the module. So you can use two other measures. So yes, you can use heat sinks to reduce heat. You can also run out of those because they're very limited. So then you have to use synthesis to recharge them. Whereas simply powering option two, the shields on or off will reduce the heat and flying with the fuel scoop off before you clear the system of which you can easily turn it back on and get fuel. It takes a second, pop it up over here. I want to power it on, quick access. Ready to go. I need it off. Instantaneous. Emergency off. Everything's cool? Ah, uh, I have it quick menu. I leave the menu, hop over here, hop over here, hop over here. It immediately brings me back to the screen. I have it on a hot menu here. I've not changed it. I'm doing exploration. I am concerned with this module specifically. I want it right here. When you log off and log in, you have to re-put this here like this so you can see it. Maybe you want to scroll it down a bit. Okay, no problem. There it is. I prefer to have it at the bottom and leave it right there. So when I look, it's right there in front of me. Right there. I can also do that, if per se I needed to, with my shield generator. Shield generator off. Instantaneous. Jefferson takes a minute to let me know, but it's off. Shields on. Instantaneous, the shields come on. Why? Well, I'll show you. Very simply, my system is at maximum. If I'm flying around to an exploration, hips matter, right? You can see, right? Here we are. Keep waiting. Climbing up. There they go. It's a bi weave. No waiting. Climbing up. It'll get to 100, no problem. I don't need my weapons, I'm doing exploration. I don't need my engines at full maximum, I'm doing exploration. I'm more concerned with my system. 
I'm doing scans, I'm doing everything else. I can fly my ship around with zero issue. I'm in super cruise. I'm already at a speed that surpasses my normal thrusters. I don't need them at full max to an exploration. Don't need to. Don't have to. I can, but I don't have to. I'd much rather prefer to fly like this, because what happens if an oopsie occurs? Could happen. I could have an oops. Maybe I'm flying into a planet and I forget to adjust the engines. Over. Don't have to, but I forget. For some reason, I'm coming in on an impact to something, or something pops in. I don't have time to adjust pips. I'm flying, I'm in super cruise, and something happens to orbit between me and my destination. Drops me out, emergency. Kovas system pulls me out of super cruise. It's not a Thargoid, thank God, right? It's not a Thargoid or an interdicting ship like a pirate. I ran next to a black hole too close. Between my jump and my next jump, a black hole occurred. So now I've got problems. My ship integrity, all these things. But if my engines are at half, I don't automatically start being sucked towards it. Though I may need to put power into engines to pull away from it. I don't need it initially, right? So playing around with these pips, getting used to them, you can definitely make it happen and bypass requiring to use a module. You can use your pips, powering the module on, powering the module off. You can eliminate other accessories. You can make them unnecessary, let's say. You can use heat sinks to do other things than just to do heat sinks because you're hot. You may want to run the ship as cold as possible and do stealth ops. Not because you're running too hot. Danger, danger, my ship's too hot. No. I need to use the heat sink so I can run even colder and fly under the radar so they don't detect me. I can go stealth mode and pop heat sinks to go so off the radar I don't even look like anything. I fly right past the Thargoid. The Thargoid doesn't even know I'm there that stealth mode. I have done that. I have taken them very specifically for me, and not because I need them because of running too hot. I'm using them to bypass getting detected, which is also fun. I wish they took the time to do some other things, which they did. They got them now for caustic, right? Very redo of the module, but it works. I wish they had some other options. I wish they had other options for limpets as well. But they haven't tampered with just yet. That's why we on our channel go through and do things like this. The basics cover it. We also do some other things and have conversations. What if? What if we were setting the FDEV sheet? What would we change and why would we change it? Like we talked about on here. Starter location. Where's the rest of the ships? Why aren't they attached to the missions so they can learn even further than just those tutorials, right? Just like in here. We know. It's awful grouchy. I flew past. They thought I was doing something, right? But I wasn't. I'm at my landing pad. But it said I was loitering at someone else's. Clearly I wasn't. I have to fly to my landing pad because they lit up one in front of me. That's their fault. They should have moved me to that one. Having a landing pad appear in front of me is called entrapment as far as that goes. So that's a no bueno. Not happening. So. That's the basics. Right? Covers the full range of all those basics. It's quite lengthy. But there's a lot of really old videos out there that don't really do as much as they could. So we covered it all. There's quite a range there. A lot of stuff. Hop back to our chit chat. So, if more is required as far as questions and things like that, most of the videos that we have on here, I do it in real time. So, if I'm streaming live, I'm in there doing it. I usually have no problem stopping and giving a little bit of instruction, helping somebody out. I do have videos that go through that in detail as well. Both hypothetical things that can be corrected and other instances which can make you a better pilot in that instance, more comfortable with the ship. Practice, right? 
exploration of what can you do, what can't you do. There's a lot of options, a lot of different module allocations. There's tons of different slots on the ships. At base, if we didn't have any alternatives, we just had the core only for the ships, and there was no other modular components. Very much so would those ships fall into those categories very specifically, but they're not. When the Python came out, they took an allowed modularization to everything. As far as the game's lore is concerned, that's where it began. Modularizing that gave us a whole lot more options. There's a lot of probabilities there. So, that being said, appreciate it. Thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next one.